that rain arrives. Into Monday then, uh, plenty of bright weather towards the north and east of the UK, one or two showers up towards the far northeast, still a bit wintry in nature here, but elsewhere it's all about the wet and windy weather moving in from the west and southwest. So many western and southwestern parts of the UK, particularly down towards the southwest, seeing some very heavy rain at times on Monday. And as that rain moves into colder air in Scotland, we could see some snow falling, particularly during the afternoon into the overnight period. And again, some of that snow above about two or 300 metres could be quite heavy in nature, with heavy rain towards the south and east of Scotland. That sets the scene for a very unsettled day across Scotland on uh, Tuesday. Again, heavy snow across the hills, heavy rain towards lower levels. Elsewhere, a mix of sunshine and showers. And that sets the scene for the rest of the week ahead. All the areas seeing unsettled weather. Showers are longer spells of rain, with temperatures near average. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon. It's just coming up to three o'clock. Hello and welcome to GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. I know what you're thinking. She looks like Fozzie Bear. Her hair is getting bigger. It is. Over the next few hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. This show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course, it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me in the next hour is broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly and also broadcaster and author Christine Hamilton. In a few moments' time, we'll be going head-to-head -head in a clash of minds with GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson and also Adam Brooks, a businessman and activist. 
Coming up, as Owen Jones issues a groveling apology and joins other lovies in apologising for speculating on the Princess of Wales health, is more regulation on social media the answer? And then he's earning £100,000 a year enough. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says it's not a huge salary. What do you make of that? My great British debaters will be going head to head on this over his claims. And imagine being people trafficked. My guest at five in Outside will be here to share her harrowing story and her inspirational campaign against the practice. You will not want to miss that. And why was my producer Alex fined 150 quid? Was it A, spitting gum? Was it B, skipping a queue? Or was it C, picking his nose? Stay tuned to find out. But first, let's get your latest news headlines. Very good afternoon to you. It is a minute past three. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. And some breaking news for you. Russia's Black Sea fleet is now functionally inactive. That's according to the Defence Secretary after a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol. This was the moment two Russian Navy vessels were targeted and struck. Security sources have told GB News UK-supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used in the strike. A major military communication centre has also been damaged. It marks the largest attack on the Russian-controlled ports in the war so far as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Islamic State has released new footage which appears to back up the terror group's claim it was behind Friday's attack in Moscow that's killed 137 people. We've chosen not to show that video. Russia, however, continues to point the finger at Kyiv, claiming it arrested four suspects attempting to escape across the border into Ukraine. Uh, you can see here the four men being taken into custody in Moscow for interrogation. Russian authorities, as I said, have uh, risen the number, have lifted the number of people killed to 137. The White House says Islamic State's claims of responsibility for the attack is credible. The Prince and Princess of Wales have said they're enormously touched by the kind messages of support. Uh, Catherine announced her cancer diagnosis on Friday and revealed she's started preventative chemotherapy. A statement from Kensington Palace also says the couple are grateful the public understand their request for privacy. The Chancellor has defended the government's record on affordable housing after claiming £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. Uh, Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go far... Uh, not, as not as far as people would think, at least in his Surrey constituency, amid higher house prices and the rising cost of living. The average home now costs around eight times the average income. It was half that in the 1990s. The Chancellor told Camilla Tomini lower taxes will make a difference. The average house price is, in that part of the world, £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch, and those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this yeah. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full-time, their income go up by £1,800. Labour Party Chair Annalise Dodds says tax rises are to blame and has promised changes under a Labour government. You know, there's a big difference, Camilla, between what Labour is setting out, especially on taxation, and what we're seeing under the Conservatives. We've seen taxes going up 25 times under the Conservatives. Our instinct is always to make sure that working people are not paying the price for government mistakes. That's what's happened, I'm afraid, under the Conservatives. So, of course, our approach would always be to try and reduce that impact on working people. We've seen the opposite, I'm afraid, under recent Conservative governments. Chilling levels of harassment are posing a serious threat to social cohesion. That's according to an independent government advisor. A review led by Dame Sarah Khan will be published tomorrow, showing more than 75% of the public feel they can't speak their mind. It suggests many people feel society's become more divisive and cites the case of a teacher who went into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a class. 
Dame Sarah says journalists, teachers and people working in the arts are subjected to severe levels of abuse, often resulting in self-censorship. It's understood the report will recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. And China's believed to be targeting Britain with a wave of cyber attacks aimed at disrupting the democratic system. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is expected uh, to warn MPs tomorrow about state-backed interference in Britain's political system by Chinese hackers. It's understood some Chinese officials were summoned by Parliament's Director of Security in relation to the cyber threats. It comes a year after a report found Britain is unprepared for a large-scale ransomware attack because of a lack of investment. And Simon Harris is set to become Ireland's youngest Prime Minister after no other candidates to lead his Fianna Gael party came forward. It follows the surprise resignation of Leo Varadkar on Wednesday for what he described as personal and political reasons. At the age of just 37, Mr Harris will be Ireland's youngest Taoiseach. He's expected to be formally elected in April after the Easter recess. Well, for the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen, or go to our website. Now, it's back to Nana. Good afternoon. It's just coming up to eight minutes after three o'clock. I'm Nana Akwe. This is GB News. Welcome to The Clash. First, though, shame on those who embarked on a journey of conspiracy theory about Princess Catherine. I personally couldn't work out what all the fuss was about and said, leave her alone, poor woman. But some people showed their true colours. Owen Jones, for one, has now issued a grovelling apology after his ridiculous conspiracy theory he had previously claimed to be obsessed. Oh, my God, he had expressed. And on learning of Catherine's diagnosis, he later tweeted, as someone who speculated on this without considering it could be a serious health condition, I'm very ashamed, to be honest, and all the very best to her. Silly little man. At least he had the wherewithal to apologise. Actress Blake Lively, another one who has also issued a grovelling apology for an ill-advised jibe about Photoshop before she learnt of Catherine's diagnosis. Writing on Instagram, she said, I'm sure no one cares today, but I feel like I have to acknowledge this. I made a silly post around the uh, Photoshop fails frenzy, and, oh, man, that post has me mortified today. I'm sorry. Sending love and well wishes to all, always. Even global stars like Kim Kardashian, who commented to her over 100 million followers by posting a snap on Instagram of herself leaning up against a car and appearing to refer to the royal and all the gossip, as she told fans, on my way to find Kate. She's facing backlash from her followers to so take it down. When you have a platform, you must attempt to use it wisely. They knew that Catherine was ill and having surgery, but were totally irresponsible in their actions, coming up with unfounded, ridiculous theories. Of course, everyone's entitled to their opinion, and Catherine is a high-profile figure. But their behaviour was silly and cruel. Well, now they have the truth. At least, though, they have the grace to acknowledge their mistake and apologise. But one positive that has come out of all of this is that scientists are now looking into why so many young, healthy people are getting abdominal cancers. So, in summary, as Owen Jones issues a grovelling apology and joins other lovies in apologising for speculating on the Princess of Wales's health, is more regulation of social media the answer? So before we get stuck into the debates over the next hour, let me introduce you to my clashers. Joining me today is GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson and also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Well, here's what else is coming up in this hour. Should we have more regulation on social media? What are your thoughts? As the fallout of the vile conspiracy theories surrounding the Princess of Wales's health continue, should we crack down on social media to combat misinformation? Then, how about this? The Tories are at it again, aren't they? Do you think it's time they ditched the idea of a leadership race? As Penny Mordaunt and Tom Tugendhat's names swirl in plots to oust Rishi, would a change of leader save the party? Of course it wouldn't. 
And then, should we ban protests outside schools? As an independent advisor for social cohesion advises that buffer zones outside schools and a West Yorkshire teacher is still in hiding uh, should be protected. So, what do you think? Should there be some sort of bus buffer zone? And then ISIS brides, should they be allowed to return to the UK as 19 British jihadi brides have been found in Syria? Are they still Britain's responsibility? And the final question we'll ask is, should Israel be banned from Eurovision? As a Rio, Cine as a Rio cinema in London says it will be boycotting this year's contest because of Israel. So should, should they be blackballed from the competition? That's coming up in the next hour. Tell me what you think on everything we're discussing. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. So uh, let's get started. Welcome again to my clash of senior GB News political commentator Nigel Nelson, also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Adam Brooks, I'm going to come to you first. Uh, what do you feel about this particular incident? All that backlash that they're getting, they opened their mouths and talked rubbish, and now Look, it's coming to uh, them. As someone with, I've got a big Twitter platform mm. or X, so I know whatever you say can come back to haunt you. Mm. So uh, I'm pretty pleased that I sort of stayed out of this. Kate Middleton uh, saga. I was actually away a few weeks ago mm. and I came back and I tweeted saying I've been away out the country three days and I've come back and apparently Catherine's dead. Oh, God, don't uh, say you that. Know, she's and not dead, by the no, way. Uh, you know, she's split, splitting up with William and, and I put, like, a massive lull sort of thing as if to say, what, ridiculous. what is this all about? Now, the serious thing is here is that a lot of the trust has gone from our institutions, our mm. governments, from COVID. We was bombarded with so much misinformation uh, that was purported as, as, as the truth back mm. then. That, you know, certainly I, I don't trust our government. I don't trust a lot of the medical world either. So that trust has gone. And I think the same with maybe the royal news. But I think that the palace actually threw Kate under the bus. Do you they, think? Yeah. Because, you know, she wasn't seen for many months. There could have been a statement to say, look, please respect our privacy. There's something wrong. I was told by someone in the media that she wasn't well a good few weeks ago, mm. so that's another reason I sort of stayed out. But this could have been stopped. That a lot of these conspiracies, you know, why, why put a photo out there that they then had to kill in the media um, and, and, and withdraw because it had been manipulated? But all, a lot of their pictures are manipulated. That's just... I know, but you know, it, it fuels... Even... So, basically, it goes back to the COVID um, sort of era. Lack of information and misinformation causes conspiracies. And we had both here. We had a lack of information and then a picture come out that blatantly had been doctored beyond belief. But so it's going, to, it's going to stir people up. But a lot of these celebrity posts that I read, they're quite embarrassing, to be fair. And they should, they should be feel embarrassed. Um, and a lot of people, and people that actually come on this show, uh, not this show, this, uh, this channel, channel yeah. have deleted tweets as well. Mm. You know, so um, I think it makes you realise that whatever you put on social media, you've got to own, mm. Mm. really. Well, um, I, d I did a monologue, but I said, poor Catherine, I don't understand what the, all the furore is about, about mm. a photograph. Why don't they just leave her alone? So I, I'm not ashamed of that at all. Nigel Nelson. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think that the, the first thing, thing here is that... Um, uh, uh, Kate is a public figure, but she's not public property. No. So the idea of treating her as such and speculating on her illness or whatever people were speculating over, uh, um, I just don't think, think it should be done in the first place. Your point about tweet responsibly, absolutely. The other thing, um, just to take Adam, uh, Adam up on his point, uh, that Adam was saying that the palace should have done more. Mm. I think that because she's not public property, she must decide what is best for her and her family. Now, um, she decided that the, she wanted to make a statement, but in her own good time, and for good reason. She had to deal with her young children, three children, ten and under, um, tell them what is going on. Obviously, she had to deal with William too. They both then had to deal with the family. And when she finally came out, she chose the day that those children children are starting their Easter school holidays. Yeah. That means that they've now got um, several weeks that they can uh, digest everything in private um, as, a f as a loving family, and that was the way to do it. So if you look at the timing of it, I think Kate got it absolutely spot on. Brilliant woman. Yeah, she's... Well, I think it fueled madness. I think it fueled conspiracies and the lack of information sort of just amplified that 
because people were sitting here thinking, well, why isn't she here? But why do they need to know, though? I just don't get why mm. they have to be informed. But the know? conspiracy theorists are responsible for their own conspiracy. Exactly. So it, it, you can't really blame blame Kate or indeed the Pallister. I think that your point about the, the Mother's Day picture, absolutely right. Um, the advisers should have, should have had a look at that mm. and, uh, and actually seen the problem with it and that news agencies would then refuse to uh, disseminate it. Um, but, Nigel, but that was no different from many other pictures that have been, you know, manipulated by the palace. I mean, they found they rustled up a load of other pictures that have been have had similar treatment. Yeah, I think that, that when you've got a situation where there are conspiracies running out there, um, I mean, we, we seem to all agree that's wrong in the first place. Uh, what you don't do is put a picture out that uh, respectable news agencies might choose to not send out or recall. Um, it, th we're in a different world now. We, we, we've oh, got, we've got AI out there, and th yeah. that could have been a completely false picture mm. um, because you can now create such things. Uh, who, who was the advisor? She didn't have a, an engagement ring. It, they, if you're an advisor, you know, you look at that picture and think, people are going to start picking up on that. Mm. That was needless, yeah, in my opinion. No, no, no right. engagement yeah. ring or no yeah. ring. People are going to speculate. It doesn't matter if it was uh, a princess or a celebrity. They're, they're going to speculate. The advisers let her down. That's in absolutely my opinion. right. But That's what, my view what, too. What, quickly, one, one thing is open Briefly, the door. We want to move it's on. open the door for mainstream media figures to start calling for uh, Twitter and things to be shut down. And they'd love that because social media is taking over with the news. Mm. I don't want this to sort of lead to censorship. It, it, it mustn't do that. Right, OK. And, uh, OK, well, listen, what are your thoughts? GB views at GBnews.com. But we absolutely will respect Kate because we're not going to go on and on uh, about this. But on this subject, could Wobbly Rishi be on his last legs? I don't know. A core group of right-wing Tory MPs have openly discussed housing Rishi Sunak and replacing him with a unity candidate such as Tom Tugendhat at a series of meetings plotting against the Prime Minister has intensified in recent days. That's following the disclosure that MPs on the right of the party were considering backing Penny Mordaunt as his successor. But would a change of leader save the Tories' dire position in the polls? So what do you think? Should they ditch their leadership race? I'll start with you, Nigel Nelson. No, they shouldn't. I mean, the, the, this is a group of not very clever um, Tory MPs who are thinking this. They're so desperate because they can see themselves losing their seats. Mm. Um, first of all, if they, um, if it was to succeed, which it probably won't, because most Tory MPs wouldn't back it, so it's, it's so a, it's not going to happen. Just supposing it did happen, there would have to be an instant general election. Rishi Sunak himself might call one because what else has he got to lose? Mm. But even if he didn't, the public are not going to stand a third prime minister <laughs> uh, coming in without their consent. So the polls will be where they are. Yeah. The Tories will be will get into the general election even more divided than they, than they are and will probably get wiped out. So th these, this is really pretty dim thinking on behalf of the Tory MPs. Uh, I, I, I disagree. Really? Totally. Because, look, at the end of the day, under Rishi Sunak, they are, they are going to be annihilated. The polls are getting worse every week. Some of us forecast this last year. He, he wasn't wanted by the members, he wasn't wanted by the voters. Most MPs didn't want Rishi Sunak as the Prime Minister. It was, it, it was a ridiculous decision what they did installing him as the leader of the Conservatives. And now they're paying for it. The only way this Conservative Party wins... Uh, they can't win the election. Doesn't get annihilated, I should say, is if they go further right and start tackling things like uh, illegal immigration, and, and legal uh, migration as well, because that is... All. When well, I speak to people... Why is that right-wing? I mean, that's... No, I don't even think further, that's No, right. because there are lots of MPs in this Conservative Party that shouldn't be Conservative MPs. They should be with the Liberal Democrats. Mm. You know, they're not true Conservatives. Well, you could always argue that an awful lot of them should be with Reform, no, <laughs> uh, on, the, on the right of the party. Nigel, the only but... way that the polls... Um, the, the change in any sort of way, maybe five, ten points or more, is if they go with someone like a Priti Patel a Robert Jemrick or a Suella Bravo. Yeah, but the, point I'm making but the MPs is, yeah. are not going to allow that to happen. The, the, the point I'm making is that we're now too late to actually do that. They've, they've, um, they've tried this. They got rid of Boris, first of all. They replaced him with Liz Truss. That was a complete disaster. <laughs> we had, they had to have a coronation for Rishi Sunak because they were so desperate. So um, none of these things are actually going to help terribly. Yes, there's, there's going to be a debate in the Tory party about, whether or, uh, about the heart and soul of the party, whether 
whether they should go more right, right, whether they should be more centrist. Bear in mind, the British public on the whole are, are centrist rather than uh, right or illegal left. Illegal immigration and, and immigration is probably the most important thing that they could tackle. Well, um, cost of living the, is the most important yeah, thing in, that in they this tackle. election. So if they went someone a little bit more hard line on illegal immigration, maybe someone with, you know, the balls to start trying to turn these boats back or yeah, leave the, the ECHR, the, 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 the this polls idea, this will idea, that's a, that. You know, that's a reform policy now. The idea of turning the boats back is a complete nonsense. All it would do is capsize boats and pitch women and children into the English Channel where they're There's they very drown. few women and children, and you know that. Well, there's not that, there's not that few. I've got, I've got the... Uh, um, because I live in Kent, that I've got some of the, um, uh, the, hot the hotels where migrants are staying around me, and I've seen an awful lot of children there playing in car parks because that's all they got, they're trying to construct schools for them. So there certainly are some coming over. I, I do accept that it's mostly young men. Um, so turning the boats back, it worked in Australia. Australia has 190 miles of international waters between uh, the Australian mainland and Indonesia. The boats are bigger. You cannot start turning well, around dinghies. It. Greece did it and just got a little rap on the knuckles from, I think, the... And ECHR. people drowned. And right, people so drowned there. But I don't think you can go into an election with a, with a manifesto thing manifesto commitment saying, OK, well, we'll, we'll, we'll actually no, uh, kill people. I, I believe the people I speak to I, on the I street... I don't think he was saying kill people. I think that's a bit no, unfair. But He's not said that. The, but, it, but if you turn the boats around, the whole point is... Well, the reason you put they, them they, on your boat and then you take them back to where yes. they have come from. If it's a boat that's about to sink, you're not going to put a string and attach it to your boat and then turn it around. Come on. Well, well, well I mean, Adam was talking about turning them around. But well, the you I, can do, but there was a turn of phrase. All right, well, let's take, take your, your, let your let's solution. Yeah, okay. your solution to it. Just what, in case the boat is not seaworthy. If it is, we, can turn it around. We then, then put the, the migrants on, a, on one of our boats and take them out to France, is presumably what you're suggesting. Well, if their boat is not seaworthy, yeah. Right. Well, why not take them back to, to Dover, which well, is what because, they're doing now? Because what normally happens is they get on the boat, which is... They don't just... They, because because I, I find it so incredible that people come up with this when they know that when we pick up people from their boats, we put them on our boat anyway. So why would that be any different if we're going in that direction instead of turning our boat? Once they're here, because they're not going they're, back, Nigel. They're on the boat... Because, oh, sorry, once they're on the boat... Yeah. Then, ..which was what would happen anyway... Right. ..instead of reversing the boat and coming back to the UK, you just go straight back to France. Yeah, but the whole point is that the, by that time they'll have to be in English waters. There are no international waters between Dover and Calais. So the French won't intervene with them unless they ask for help uh, or they're in, in trouble. Once they cross that border into British territory, we are then bound to take them back to, uh, to British land. You know land. what I would do? I'd say, yeah, 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 and then I'd simply just carry on and drop them back <laughs> to France. A I'm Prime sorry, Minister with balls would, would do that. That's what I would do. But listen... In my opinion. Well, listen, uh, what do you think? GBviews at GBnews.com. That's exactly what I would do. They normally board the boat anyway. So instead of turning your boat round and taking them back uh, to the UK, you just get on that boat, they get on your boat, and it just keeps going the way it was going. Enough is enough. Back that way. Right, well, welcome again if you just joined me. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. Coming up, should ISIS brides be allowed to return to the UK as it's been revealed that 19 British jihadi brides are being held in the same detention centre as Shamim Megan? So should they all be allowed to return? But next, the government is set to be advised to establish buffers zones around schools after a teacher was forced into hiding after showing pupils a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. So should we ban protests outside schools? Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Can you just let us know if, if there have been people getting into contact with you as a local councillor about how they feel about every lamppost, which is supposed to be public, mm. neutral territory, being covered in these flags? Has it made some of your constituents nervous to walk the streets? It's a complete range of people, including people who are from the Bangladeshi Muslim community who support who support the um, endeavours of what's going of, of Gaza, of what is going on, and are hostile to the actions of the Israeli government, but feel that they shouldn't have these flags on streets. I thought if you walk down some of the streets, it doesn't look like a London borough. It looks almost like what you would imagine in Ceausescu's Romania, with flags on every street. Well, 
Well, Peter, can you let us know uh, what it's like in the council and their activities in Tower Hamlets? How much time, for example, has been spent discussing issues relating to what's happening in the Middle East? Has it dominated quite a lot of time? No. Um, let's be absolutely fair to the mayor and the administration. There's a heck of a lot to do in this council. We have extremes of deprivation and, um, of course, wealth because of the Clary Walls and City Fringe. We have huge problems on the council. And to be fair, the council spends its time doing council matters. And they said initially, in fact, absolutely carefully at council meetings, we can't interfere with foreign policy, but we've got a lot to do on national policy and local policy. Let's concentrate on that. So there hasn't been too much pressure that you can see from people living in the borough for the council to take a stance? Members of the council and the administration have, have um, put their support. As I've said, we're talking of free speech. They're entitled to do that, but it's what happens where the council is responding to absolutely everybody, all 320,000 people who live in our borough. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon. It's just coming up to 28 minutes after 3 o'clock. I'm Nana Aquir. This is GB News. We are the People's Channel. It is The Clash, and it's time for this next story. An official review is set to recommend that protests be banned outside schools. Now, this review, uh, which has been led by the Independent Social Cohesion Advisor, Dane Sarah Khan, highlights the case of a teacher who was forced into hiding after showing pupils at Batley Grammar School a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, the incident sparked large protests at the school, and three years on, the teacher is still in hiding and suffers from PTSD or post traumatic stress disorder. Dame Sarah's report is expected to recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. Well, let's welcome again to my clash as political commentator Nigel Nelson and also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Nigel Nelson, what do you think? I'm slightly uncomfortable with this. Um, right. I mean, I think that it always depends on the protest. A protest outside a school, or indeed a protest anywhere, it shouldn't be intimidating, especially for children. I think that's really important um, because there is a safeguard issue there. It should be within the law, but the idea of banning it seems to be a restriction on free speech. Um, and that's the bit that I find difficult to cope with. If, for instance, um, uh, Palestinian protesters were chanting from the river to the sea mm. outside a Jewish school, mm. that would be anti-Semitic, anti that would be breaching the law, the police would then move them on. Okay. They wouldn't. So is it OK for them to chant it then in the street? Yes, it is, because it's, is... it's not necessarily oh. an anti-Semitic oh, crowd. Let's Come on, not the, the police would not move them on. I don't care, even if it was outside a Jewish school. Our police have shown two-tier policing. They would not move that on. I'm sorry, Nigel. I th it, the evidence is clear that the police are not acting with the Palestinian protests. And I think... Well, they say they would. The police say they would. Well, I mean, they, this hold is on, the they, point they about said the, about that they the... would arrest anyone with yeah. masks. It's they the point didn't. about they the chant... They would stop the protest. The, the chant they itself is not, is not in itself anti-Semitic, no, but it depends on the context no. and the interpretation of it. Yeah, well, if you choose to interpret it as not anti-Semitic, like you may be doing, that's fair enough. But the Jewish people, and when they're doing it in a protest, at a march, where people are also calling for jihad, I would say, at that point, it is absolutely anti-Semitic. But, but, but if it's on a march, 
march, unless, it, unless it's actually uh, aimed at Jewish people. That's what I mean about a Jewish school, a synagogue, um, it would be anti-Semitic because it's quite obviously provocative. But the actual words aren't anti-Semitic. What it means is uh, a link between Gaza on one side of the country and the West Bank on the other, mm. should there ever be a state of Palestine. A lot of people believe it to mean something different as in death. I know they do, the but, but uh, I mean, a lot of people... Wipe out the, the yes, uh, indeed they do. Uh, and that, um, uh, uh, that Hamas probably believe that too. Well, uh, but Hamas weren't, weren't the originators of the phrase. But that's irrelevant who originated the phrase. And okay. I do hear people doing that and saying, oh, mm. but the person who initially did it... Yes, 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 that's irrelevant because in the context of the march, mm. which is against um, the, the, the war in Israel, yeah. uh, which is obviously being started by Hamas, if people are shouting that, then I'm afraid it doesn't work for me. There's no, there's no way of saying that that's... Not I mean, uh, going back to protests outside schools, mm. I've got three kids. I'd be horrified if there was protests of, of, of any protest. I don't care what they're protesting mm. outside the school because it could scare them. And I think it could scare teachers and it, it, it could scare parents as well. So I would like to see that ban. And this is coming from someone that protested a lot during mm. COVID, legally, you know. But the right to protest and free speech is a must. But when it sort of it, it can put children in danger, which I think we've we've seen two bomb threats mm. um, during this uh, Gaza uh, protests um, on schools. Now, this is extreme, and I, I believe the the police are scared to tackle Islamic extremism, and that needs to be said again with, with the chanting. I think the police are scared mm. to, to to police the letter of the law because they think there's going to be some sort of violent uh, response to that. Now, that shouldn't be the case. The police should do their job no matter what. They can't be uh, two-tier policing in this country. This so is the wrong way round, because you're supposed to be the one that says <laughs> that we shouldn't be doing this, and you're the one who's... Yeah, look, I, I, I just... I, I, I would be horrified if there was a mass <laughs> protest outside my kid's school, because I know how much that would scare my little girl. Mm. So I don't think it's right. And the, the protests have become very toxic over the last four or five years. Uh, protests are different now to what they used to be. They've evolved, and people are getting away with a lot more than they used to get I'm away with. I'm not sure that's true. I mean, the, the, in fairness to the Palestinian protests, none of them have turned into riots. I know pr a protest... Some of them that have, I... actually, Nigel. I think you've got that slightly wrong. We've had fireworks the fired at one, police. Yeah. Well, yes, but it wasn't well, a riot. Right. Well, that I mean, is really I mean the, the fireworks were obviously illegal, and the police should have acted on something like that. That some of the things that were being said, they should have acted on that too. Mm. Well, I think just there. Well, I think it's perfectly reasonable to keep them away from schools. I don't see the okay. problem with that. I would expect that to be the case, and away from people's houses, MPs' homes, all that kind of thing. Say what you like, but not outside my house. Uh, right. If you just tuned in, what do you think? GBviews at gbnews.com. I'll read some of those emails. This is GB News. It's just coming up to 32 minutes after three o'clock. I'm Nana Akwia. Uh, still to come, we'll be discussing jihadi brides. But first, let's get your latest news headlines. Nana, thanks very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. It's just after half past three, our top story this hour. Russia's Black Sea Fleet is now functionally inactive, according to the Defence Secretary here in the UK. That's after a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol. For those watching on TV, this was the moment two Russian Navy vessels were targeted and then struck. <laughs> Well, security sources have told GB News that UK-supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used in that strike. A major military communication centre has also been damaged. And it marks the largest attack on the Russian-controlled port in the war so far, as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Meanwhile, four suspects have been taken to Russia's investigative committee headquarters following Friday's terror attack. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the shooting, which killed more than 130 people. The US have backed that claim, but Russia is continuing to suggest that Ukraine was involved, allegations, though, that Kyiv has denied. The Prince and Princess of Wales have said they are enormously touched by messages of support from the public following Catherine's cancer diagnosis. She revealed on Friday that she started treatment... And in a statement from Kensington Palace, they said the couple are grateful the public understand their request for privacy. And the Chancellor has doubled down on his claim that £100,000 a year is not a huge salary. 
Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go as far as you would think for people in his Surrey constituency because of rising house prices and the cost of living. He also said he does expect the general election will take place in October. Those are the headlines. Plenty more to come with Nana throughout the afternoon. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you, Sam. Coming up, my monologue on Sakir Starmer. But next, do ISIS brides have any right to return to the United Kingdom? GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6 a.m. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit about Sebastian? Um, I just, it really amazes me how a mother um, who can lose a child in such a shocking and unexpected way, so little, so precious, can then turn that grief into something so positive. How did you find the strength to get up, um, get a camera crew, as you say, travel to the other side of the world and investigate all of this? Um, I was angry at Sebastian for dying. Um, you know, you feel like saying, God, I'm 32 years later and I can still get very, very upset about it. I was angry that something that, that while he while he was born and lived with me and slept and then died, they were actively campaigning in New Zealand to try and stop this happening because they had a very high cot death rate there. Um, they had the, the, the lady, uh, the Anne Diamond, if you like, of uh, New Zealand, a, a television presenter called Judy Bailey, went on telly every night and said, if you're just about to put your baby down to sleep, put him on his or her back, not the tummy, and this will help. And there, cot death rate plummeted. And I went out to New Zealand and met her, and it was anger that drove me to come back and demand that we have the same advert here, um, the same campaign. And, of course, I got all this complete nonsense from the Department of Health saying, you know, oh, young mothers do not watch television, I was told. In other words, while New Zealand mums were being told how to save their babies' lives. We actively denied British mums that advice wow. during the time that Sebastian and others were dying. And, and the other point I suppose to make is it's helpful to educate all generations because when I think when I had my mm. babies, my mum would say, oh, he's not settling, just stick him on his tummy, he'll be much happier, that's what we did with you. And we had to say, well, things have changed mm. and, you know, yes. but it's about educating everybody because it's not everybody, just the mums that get their hands on the babies. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, if you just tuned in. Where have you been? It's all right, you've just missed 38 minutes, it's fine. This is GB News, we're live on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Queer. It is The Clash. Now, Jihadi Bride Shamima Begin is just one of a total of 19 British women being held at a Syrian detention camp. Now, uh, the commander of the Al Roj camp has said that there are 19 British women and 35 children living there. And one of the women has begged to be allowed to return to the UK. Countries like Canada and Germany have already allowed jihadi brides to return home. Uh, so what do you think? Should we? Should they be allowed to return to the UK? Well, let's welcome again to my clashes, GB News' senior political commentator Nigel Nelson, and also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. Adam, what should we do with these people? No, um, I believe that they made their bed and they must lie in it. I would like them to rot forever in these detention camps. I'm not being harsh. They went and cozied up to the enemy, an enemy that wants to end our way of life. Um, they're not 
the innocence that they're, they're trying to put out there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of intelligence that say Shamima Begum would walk around Yazidi camps with a machine gun that would witness and encourage beheadings. Um, I believe when someone has seen and done things that bad, there's no coming back from that. But of that. course, all of that, we don't have actual evidence or no... No, but there, 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 are, there, are, um, there are many journalists and there are many people within the intelligence community that basically say there is a lot more to Shamima Begum than what we know. I believe she's a danger. Mm. Now, when I go off on one on, on Twitter or X about this, I'm called a racist. But I've said exactly the same thing about Jihadi Jack. Mm. He's a white man. I don't care. They're a danger. We've got enough bad people in this country, and I, I'm a father of three kids. I do not want another danger or 19 dangerous people coming back. At the end of the day, we've got to stay strong, but I fear, under a Labour government, <gasps> that she will come back. Mm -hmm. And I would put money on that, that in the next five years, under a Labour government, she will be allowed to, to come back with the blessing of Sir Keir Starmer. Mm. Nigel Nelson. Um, they are a danger. I think that's absolutely right. <coughs> uh, but they're more dangerous where they are than if they were back here. Why? Um, because at least back here we can keep an eye on them. Um, yeah, but not we can, here if we, there. Can, we can prosecute them if, we can, if um, we can find evidence of crimes. This is what America has been doing. And both under Trump mm. and under Biden, they got their various people back. Half of them went on trial and were prosecuted for mm. terrorism offences. Um, some weren't, but at least they were back in the country. The argument all the way through is then we can actually see what they're doing. You leave them in, in these Kurdish um, uh, refugee... Well, not refugee, they're detention camps in, nor in northern Syria. Uh, and who knows what happens? It's a radicalisation centre. If they weren't radicalised before, they sure as hell will be now. Well, they were radicalised because they actually left this country to well, go they, there. Well, they were, but how much worse so, would it be, would well, it be uh, if, they, if but, they're left there? OK. And if they... If, if, if then they start at start um, uh, finding a way back into the country illegally, then they could be a real right, danger. Nigel, I have a question for you. You think she should come back? Yes. What would your what, what would what would you say round your your coffee table in the morning if you found out that Shamima Begum was going to be housed next door to you? Would you be happy or not happy? Actually, I, I wouldn't be unhappy because I would know that she is being monitored by the security services. If she came back and didn't go to jail, she may well go to jail if she came back here. I would know certainly that I probably have the safest neighbourhood no, in the area. I, I don't believe that. I have loads of spooks around it. I don't you would not believe like that. You would not like. Why wouldn't I like? Be that? truthful. You would not be happy. Yes, you would I, mean, not really... I would love to talk to Sh Shamima Begum. She won't want to talk to you, Nigel. Well, she may not want to talk to me, but I'm just saying I'd love to talk to her. Nana, can we just remember <laughs> and, and, and tell the viewers what she said? She said that killing UK women and UK children is a fair retaliation. She no, is a monster. Uh, I'm not defending Shamima no, Begum not, at all. You said you wouldn't mind her living next door. I wouldn't mind what she's just said. I would not mind her that living next majesty. door because I think that she would be monitored and as a result of that she would be safe. And, yes, I would like to talk to her about everything that's happened Well, I would move. Her, as a journalist. Well, Andrew, Andrew, um, what's his name? He spoke... Andrew Drury went to yeah. speak to her and he said that she was a nasty piece of work. At the beginning, he almost fell for it all. And then he, he and he's a very nice guy. He's a very... Sure, no, I, I watch, I watch what he saw. said. And yes, we had a big interview said. with yeah. him when he yeah. actually went to see her and he gave us all the footage. And this is somebody who's actually met her, has said that she is somebody who shouldn't come back. And even the Home Secretary's, subsequent Home Secretary's, and it's certainly not racist because it was pretty Patel. Mm. Uh, you had, um, what's the other guy, Sajid Javid. You then had, um, there's been so many. And we've acted the same with Jihadi Jack, who is a white Sajid man. Sajid Javid, who else? Is it, was who was after Sajid Javid? Don't put Javid? me on the spot, I don't know. Who was after, was it, was it um, Swallow Brevman? Well, no, I think it, it was Sajid, ja it was Sajid Javid who, who uh, took her passport away. But, yeah, and... but, but she was initially, it started with, uh, with uh, Priti Patel. Yeah, that's in right. In 2018, I think it was, or 19. So, yeah, well, Sajid would have come before and then, that. Then it was Sajid Javid, uh, then it was Priti Patel, and then it was Swallow, Swallow Brevman. Brevman. See, now, they're, they're all kind of of Asian descent, so it's certainly not racism, is it? No, I don't, I don't think it's racist well, at I'm all. The, 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 the issue was actually international law, because what happened there was um, uh, the only citizenship she can use is British citizenship. Now she has no citizenship. Good. So what? 
Well, the, the so what is you that uh, that you She's cannot not make somebody anymore, stateless. Why not? We have She's because under inter international law, you cannot make someone stateless. Well, she does have. Was, she also has the Bangladeshi citizenship. No, she doesn't. What well, she has, it, she she has a, um, a right to Bangladeshi citizenship well, that she's never applied for, well, doesn't matter. and which they have refused to give her. So at the moment, she has got absolutely nowhere to go apart from Syria. Poor Shamima. Well, I, I'm not defending her. What I'm saying is that. And just what the is the international community going to do to us? I mean, if I was prime minister, I'd say, what are you going to do? She's not coming back. Yeah. Exactly. So what? What you're going to wrap us on the knuckles again? Well, they're not doing anything at all. That's what we've yeah. done. But it is against international law to make someone stateless because at the moment she's now become the Kurds' problem in Syria, whereas she's a British citizen and should be our problem I, I, here. I think they actually want to punish her properly, though. I don't think they probably want her to. And I hope she, I hope she is punished. That we have here, and she'll probably, if anything, they'll probably say we haven't got enough evidence. She may well be released. Well, there is a question of the evidence. Yes, absolutely. But how, how do you get this evidence? This is the problem. This is why. I think she wants to come here because how do you get to that evidence? It's almost impossible. She has said some awful things which suggest that she is guilty of some crime. We don't know. We don't have the evidence. How are we going to get the evidence? What's going to happen is if she comes here, she'll probably end up being free. Yeah. And well, even if she is free, she would have been monitored. The BBC would probably give her her own reality show knowing, knowing, her this, yeah, knowing this, this country. Uh, Keep her out there. She's a danger, mm. in, in my view. Well, what do you think, GBFuse at gbnews.com? And what about the other 19? There's others as well. It's not just Samima Began, uh, but she's just the tip of a horrible iceberg, I think. Uh, but coming up, my monologue on Sir Keir Starmer. Next, though, as London watch parties cancel their screenings over Eurovision in solidarity with Palestine, should Israel be banned from Eurovision? Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We've seen a much quieter day across the UK today, more in the way of sunshine than on Saturday, but things will turn more unsettled again during the week ahead. It's this little ridge of high pressure that's been moving in from the west, quieting the weather down, but notice low pressure gathering again out towards the west, and so this will be turning things more unsettled through uh, tonight into Monday. As we go through the evening and overnight period then, the showers towards the north and east of the UK will tend to ease. We'll see lots of clear weather around and here it will turn quite chilly with a touch of frost by Monday morning. Or is that towards the west and southwest? That rain is gathering. Some of the rain starting to turn quite heavy by the morning on Monday, accompanied by quite blustery winds too. But notice an increase in temperature out towards the west as that rain arrives. Into Monday then, uh, plenty of bright weather towards the north and east of the UK, one or two showers up towards the far northeast, still a bit wintry in nature here, but elsewhere it's all about the wet and windy weather moving in from the west and southwest. So many western and southwestern parts of the UK, particularly down towards the southwest, seeing some very heavy rain at times on Monday. And as that rain moves into colder air in Scotland, we could see some snow falling, particularly during the afternoon into the overnight period. And again, some of that snow above about two or three hundred metres could be quite heavy in nature, with heavy rain towards the south and east of Scotland. That sets the scene for a very unsettled day across Scotland on uh, Tuesday. Again, heavy snow across the hills, heavy rain towards lower levels. Elsewhere, a mix of sunshine and showers. And that sets the scene for the rest of the week ahead. All the areas seeing unsettled weather, showers are longer spells of rain, with temperatures near average. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel.
Good afternoon. It's fast approaching 50 minutes after 3 o'clock. This is The Clash. I'm Nana Aquir. You're watching and listening to GB News. Uh, now, London's biggest screening party for the Eurovision Song Contest has been cancelled in protest at Israel's inclusion in the competition. Now, uh, in a move that, uh, in a move that con was condemned by Jewish representatives, the Rio Cinema in East London said that this year's event would not take place, but the cinema would organise fundraising for the Palestinian aid effort. And all of this comes after the country's entry had to change lyrics uh, of the song as it would, wasn't allowed to make reference to the victims of the October 7th terror attack. So what do you think? Should Israel be banned from Eurovision? Uh, Nigel Nelson, I must say. No, I don't, think it sh I don't think Israel should be banned. I'm actually surprised that they were in, U in Eurovision in the first place, in the same way I'm a bit surprised about Australia being it. But it relates to membership of the uh, European Broadcasting Union. So to take politics out of Eurovision as much as possible, I think, is the right thing to do. It's not possible, is it, though? Well, I mean, Belarus was expelled from the, um, uh, from the Broadcasting Union back in 2021. One, but that's because they were intimidating and harassing their own staff. So it was an issue about, um, about uh, free speech, basically, there. Uh, Russia was expelled, too. It was a lot more messy. It was a bit difficult. Mm. But, of course, they would have been up against Ukraine, whereas Israel wouldn't be up against... Palestine, but broadly keep politics out. Um, I think that is that, that no reason to not let Israel compete. Well, the politics is always so in it. Though, you're saying keep, keep politics out of the most political show probably in the world. <laughs> that, you know, it, it's ridiculous. I, I detest the Eurovision Song Contest <laughs> so much. So I love I, it. I don't even like talking <laughs> about it because I think the music is terrible. It doesn't matter what country it is. It's just you know, it's terrible. Suspect. Um, look, I didn't. I didn't want Russia to be kicked out of there. I, I don't think that a song contest should be political and the arbiter of who is right and who is wrong mm. around the world. I think that is ridiculous. Um, I think we need to realise and remember what happened on October 7th as well. Thousands of innocent Jews, women, children were kidnapped, uh, including Brits. Mm. People were raped, people were murdered. Now, I don't particularly agree with what Israel has done since and children have died uh, in Gaza. It upsets me. Both things really upset me. So I'm sort of in the middle here. But Hamas but should release the hostages. If they generally agreed. wanted to stop this thing, agreed. it could do if they stopped firing the rockets as well. Yeah. I mean, the but only reason Israel doesn't look like... I've just got to keep reminding people mm. that the only reason that Israel doesn't look like Gaza is because they invested in an iron dome instead of tunnels. Right. So these rockets are firing constantly over Israel. And they were before October the 7th. I know this. Yes, they were. I've been speaking they to Willie Geller all the time about it. And this is how I first started talking to him. And I feel people just completely forget yeah. that but that is... But this is a proportion, like it's proportionality Gaza. here. No, but, mean, but if they had... If, if Gaza had an Iron Dome, then Gaza citizens probably wouldn't have been bombed... Wouldn't have felt the effects of bombing either. So it's not proportionality. They're, they're firing thousands of rockets. Hamas are firing thousands... Yes, they are. But, I mean, the, the question really about Israel's retaliation is, is whether that is proportionate to what happened on October the 7th. That's not minimising October the no, 7th. But, 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 but if you're talking about more than 30,000 people being killed... Well, they're killed because they have, do not have any protection from the missiles. It would be exactly the same on Israel's side if they didn't have an Iron Dome. So, proportionally, it is the same thing. The only reason... Israel why... is much more powerful than, than Hamas. Yeah. And they will root it but... out, and so they should. They should destroy but let, Hamas. Let's remember that Hamas has put all of its bases, all of its infrastructure under hospitals, under, uh, under exactly. apartments, under civilians that they use... You know, shields. they use as shields... Um, and but but what about the attack really on Rafa that's coming up? That you're talking about a half, one and a half well, million people. Hamas have got, you are very precious because the, uh, the Hamas have gone into Rafa. They're hidden, hiding but there. But the Israelis told the, the the civilian population to move to Rafa because it was safe. One and a half million people are now there living in tents. Now Israel is threatening an invasion of Rafa, which will kill an awful because lot more people there. Because Hamas went into Rafa knowing it was safe. That's what they keep doing. Mm. So Israel on a on a hiding to nothing. You cannot have people on your border who behave in. That manner. These people Agreed. Were firing we, we agree with that. Yes, and that's, that's right. Firing rockets. If they just stopped firing the rockets and gave back what is left of the hostages, well, the ideal would be a ceasefire on both sides. Well, yeah, absolutely. Which we all agree on, presumably. Everybody Unfortunately, Hamas keeps stop. turning down ceasefires. Well, no, like Israel's that. turned it down too. So well, because so they won't both... get the hostages back, they've said, "Give us the hostages." <laughs> well, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of complications about about that. But at the moment, do, if we agree there should be a ceasefire, absolutely. that should be for both sides. For 
both but sunk. It, but sh it, it shouldn't means. be involved. The Eurovision Song Cast Contest should not be involved in itself. No, we agree with that, Bert. <laughs> well, there you go. Well, what do you think? GBNews at GBNews.com. I'll get to read some of your thoughts uh, at GBNews or tweet me as well. This is GBNews still to come. How many times can I say GBNews? I can say it. I'll just keep saying it. Uh, well, listen, still to come, my monologue on Sir Keir Starmer. Uh, we'll be talking about robbing Peter to pay Paul with his plans for private and public schools. Uh, but first, let's get an update with your weather. Don't go anywhere. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We've seen a much quieter day across the UK today, more than aware of sunshine than on Saturday, but things will turn more unsettled again during the week ahead. It's this little ridge of high pressure that's been moving in from the west, quieting the weather down, but notice low pressure gathering again out towards the west, and so this will be turning things more unsettled through uh, tonight into Monday. As we go through the evening and overnight period then, the showers towards the north and east of the UK will tend to ease. We'll see lots of clear weather around, and here it will turn quite chilly with a touch of frost by Monday morning. Whereas out towards the west and southwest, that rain is gathering. Some of the rain starting to turn quite heavy by the morning on Monday, accompanied by quite blustery winds too. But notice an increase in temperature out towards the west as that rain arrives. Into Monday then, uh, plenty of bright weather towards the north and east of the UK, one or two showers up towards the far northeast, still a bit wintry in nature here, but elsewhere it's all about the wet and windy weather moving in from the west and southwest. So many western and southwestern parts of the UK, particularly down towards the southwest, seeing some very heavy rain at times on Monday. And as that rain moves into colder air in Scotland, we could see some snow falling, particularly during the afternoon into the overnight period. And again, some of that snow above about two or three hundred metres could be quite heavy in nature, with heavy rain towards the south and east of Scotland. That sets the scene for a very unsettled day across Scotland on uh, Tuesday. Again, heavy snow across the hills, heavy rain towards lower levels. Elsewhere, a mix of sunshine and showers. And that sets the scene for the rest of the week ahead. All the areas seeing unsettled weather. Showers are longer spells of rain, with temperatures near average. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Time is ticking on your chance to win the Great British Giveaway. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like, along with £500 in shopping vouchers for your favourite store, a games console, a pizza oven and a portable Sonos smart speaker. And the best news? You could be our next big winner just like Phil. Didn't quite believe it and still can't. Uh, and if I can win it, anybody can win it. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and Privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon and welcome to GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. And for the next few hours, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. Uh, this show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course it's yours. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today is broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly and also broadcaster and author Christine Hamilton. In a few moments' time, I'll give you my digest on Sir Keir Starmer's education plans. Is he robbing Peter to pay Paul? But also, coming up for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, is earning £100,000 a year enough? Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says that it's not. Really? He said he doesn't think it's a huge salary. What do you think? Then, imagine being people trafficked. My guest at five will be here to share her harrowing story and her inspirational campaign against the practice. She was people trafficked. You won't want to miss that one. And then why was my producer Alex fined 150 quid? Was it A, spitting gum, B, skipping a queue, or C, picking his nose? Stay tuned to find out. But before we get started, let's get your latest news headlines. Nana, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the GB newsroom. It's just gone four o'clock and we start with some breaking news coming to us out of London this afternoon, uh, where hundreds of pro-Palestine and environmental protesters are currently demonstrating at the British Museum in Bloomsbury in the capital. If you're watching on TV, you can see here many activists in their possibly hundreds there who are waving banners, Palestinian flags and uh, can be heard shouting, hands off the Middle East. The group, calling itself the Energy Embargo for Palestine, say that they will keep targeting that historic building until it ends its partnership with BP. It comes after the British Museum confirmed it was extending its partnership with BP for another decade in a deal worth some £50 million. Well, in other news today, Russia's Black Sea Fleet is now functionally inactive, according to the Defence Secretary here in the UK. That's after a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol. For those watching on television, this was the moment that two Russian Navy vessels will t were targeted and struck. <laughs> Security sources have told GB News that UK-supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used in that strike and a major military communication centre has also been damaged in the attack. It marks the largest military operation on the Russian-controlled port in the war so far as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Meanwhile, Islamic State has released new footage which appears to back up the terror group's claim that it was behind Friday's attack in Moscow. We have chosen not to show that footage, but uh, this video, for those watching on television, shows four suspects being taken into custody for interrogation in Moscow, where Russia is claiming that they have detained those attempting to escape across the border into Ukraine. The authorities there now say the number of people killed in the attack on Friday has risen to 137. Meanwhile, the White House says Islamic State's claims of responsibility for the attack is credible. To Royal News and the Prince and Princess of Wales have said they are enormously touched by the kind messages of support. Catherine announced her cancer diagnosis on Friday and revealed she has started preventative chemotherapy. In a statement from Kensington Palace last night, they said the couple are grateful for public's understanding of their request for privacy. The Chancellor has defended the government's record on affordable housing after making claims that £100,000 a year is, he said, not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt had said that it doesn't go far as far as you would think for people in his Surrey constituency amid higher house prices and the rising cost of living. 
comes as the average home now costs around eight times the average income. It was half that in the 1990s. The Chancellor told Camilla Tomini this morning that lower taxes, he says, will make a difference. The average house price is in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch. And those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this mm. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full time, their income go up by £1,800. Well, in response to those comments, Labour Party chair Annalise Dodds has said that tax rises are to blame and she promised changes under a Labour government. But there's a big difference, Camilla, between what Labour is setting out, especially on taxation, and what we're seeing under the Conservatives. We've seen taxes going up 25 times under the Conservatives. Our instinct is always to make sure that working people are not paying the price for government mistakes. That's what's happened, I'm afraid, under the Conservatives. So, of course, our approach would always be to try and reduce that impact on working people. We've seen the opposite, I'm afraid, under recent Conservative governments. Chilling levels of harassment are posing a serious threat to social cohesion. That's according to an independent government adviser. A review led by Dame Sarah Khan will be published tomorrow, showing that more than 75% of the public feel that they can't speak their mind. It suggests that many people feel society has become more divisive and cites the case of a teacher who went into hiding after showing a caricature of the Prophet Muhammad during a class. Dame Sarah says journalists, teachers and those working in the arts are subjected to severe levels of abuse, often resulting in self-censorship. It's understood the report will recommend a series of measures, including a ban on protests within 150 metres of schools. And finally, Joni Mitchell has returned to Spotify, the music streaming service, more than two years after it's after boycotting it over comments by the controversial podcaster Joe Rogan. The legendary folk singer announced that she was pulling her catalogue from the site in 2022, joining fellow musician Neil Young. Well, that was in protest against Spotify's multi-year deal with Rogan, who's accused of spreading misinformation about COVID vaccines. Both artists have called on the streamer to address the spread of false information on the site. Those are the headlines. I'll be back in the next half hour. Until then, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Now, though, it's back to Nana. Good afternoon. It's just coming up to seven minutes after four o'clock. This is GB News on TV online and on digital radio. I'm Nana Aquir. I like to call this one robbing Peter to pay Paul. The Labour Party have embarked on a journey that I can only describe as the politics of envy. I think it's time we scrutinise their policies more closely and establish in our minds what a Labour government might mean to the education system. Sir Keir Starmer and his party have for far too long capitalised on the abject failure of the Conservatives and haven't really had to explain themselves. But as part of their manifesto, Labour intend to charge VAT at 20% on private schools because I suspect they think that people who send their kids there will stump up the cash no matter what and that these people have money. They will then use this money, Labour, to fund state schools. Basically, they will rob Peter to pay Paul. But what I believe they've failed to realise, and I'm not sure whether they've factored this in, is that many people who send their kids to private schools do so at great sacrifice and are, in fact, paying twice into the education system. I spent my first year of secondary education in a state school. I'll be honest, when I started, I was at the top of the class. But by the end of the year, I was near the bottom. But then my dad got promoted to a post on Wall Street in the States. My parents sent me to a private boarding school in the UK run by nuns and my family moved to America. Thank God for the opportunity I was given to go private. At boarding school I grew in confidence and I'm here now because of it. My father's work, NatWest, and a loan my dad took out paid for my private education. We were nowhere near as rich as some of the kids there, but 
there are also many children, I would say at least half, whose parents were busting a gut to send them there. And on top of that, many of these private schools are for those with special educational needs. And in the case of my old school, they did a lot and still do a lot in the community. My old school actually has a bus that picks up el the elderly and brings them to the school for lunch. And I know this because they pick up my mum. And she's always telling me, oh, it was lovely. I had such a lovely lunch. It was lovely. I saw all the old people. I make them watch your programme, even if they fall asleep. Um, <laughs> Well, let's be honest, that'll be probably one of the first things that these private schools will scrap if they need to find more cash to fund them. So when I meet people from my ex-state school, in the main, I've achieved much higher grades and done considerably better than all of them, as have my friends from my boarding school. It is clear that the state education system is failing, but rather than robbing Peter to pay Paul, surely it would be better for the party to improve the state system without destroying the private sector. So before we get stuck into the debate, here's what else is coming up today for the Great British Debate this hour. I'm asking, is earning £100,000 a year enough? That's after Chancellor Jeremy Hunt said that it's not a huge salary. What do you think? Then at 4.50 it's Worldview. We'll cross live to Los Angeles with Paul Dudrich, the host of the Politics People podcast, and get the latest on the US. And then we'll pop over to Israel and have a word with famous mystifier Uri Geller. Then at 5, it's this week's Outside. Now, my guest recounts her harrowing story uh, being people trafficked and her inspirational journey to freedom. Do not go anywhere for that. She'll be live in the studio at 5 o'clock. She's written a book uh, about her journey. That's coming up in the next hour. Tell me what you think on everything we're discussing. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. Right, let's get started. Let's welcome again to my panel broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly and also author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton. Right, I, I shall start with you, Christine Hamilton. Oh. Yes, Christine Hamilton, yes. what do you think about this? Well, I mean, it's been very easy for Keir Starmer up till now, hasn't mm. it? He just cruises along. He didn't have to come out with any particular policies. He could just be in favour of motherhood and apple pie, and that was fine. Now the election is drawing closer and people are beginning to focus on the Labour Party. He's got to start coming up with some policies. I think this is madness for him because I can't think it's going to attract any votes at all. <laughs> he's going to find himself... Well, maybe some. No, it won't. But it's, I think it you're is right. the politics of envy. Mm. I mean, what we should be trying to do, it, it is acknowledged mm. that apart from a few standout examples, the private sector delivers a better education mm. than the state sector. I'm not demonising all state schools, of course not. There are some incredible examples. And there are some appalling private schools. But as a general rule, what we should be trying to do is get the uh, state sector up. What will happen is that there will be parents who simply can't afford the extra mm. 20% and they will have to take their kids out of school and then they will suddenly be landed into the state sector, which won't be able to cope with the extra numbers. I just I mean, don't get it. I don't get it. I, he... I don't understand why he's doing it. He's almost, it feels like he's delusional. What, what do you think? Politics of envy. Well, this is socialism for you, isn't it? So no, the of course it is. It's socialism. It's socialism. So yes. the perception is, is that you've got money, so mm. they want more of your money mm. in order to help other people's kids out. What this guy just isn't connecting with is the amount of sacrifices that normal mums and dads right. have to make yeah. in order to take, in order to allow their children to go to private schools because mm. they're concerned about the most precious thing in their lives, their mm. offsprings. And they are, for example, not changing their car, mm. they're not going on a summer holiday, they're not doing this, they're not doing that, they're, they're not having the extension. Two jobs, three jobs. Of course yeah. they are. And, and that's just not getting into his brain. And, the, and I would suggest that that's over 50% of parents. Yeah. Not everybody is on £100,000 and we're going to be talking about that I later. Know. And yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a great sort of segue to the next feature, whether a hundred grand's a lot of dough. Because if you agree, 100 grand's a lot of dough, then all of a sudden, if you've got two or three kids at private school, it's not enough dough. Well, well, that's the thing, and Jeremy Hunt is the one that's saying it isn't enough, but then, you know, the bottom line is, at least, I don't, the Conservatives wouldn't be considering this particular policy. Of course they wouldn't. I know wouldn't. they wouldn't do Absolutely this. No. Not. This no. is absurd. So no. this is where we have a di divining line between the two of them, and I think what he has done, what Keir Starmer has effectively done, is actually uh, disappoint a lot of people who would have considered voting for him, because those middle-class voters who are on those 100 grand salaries are going to be looking at this and thinking, well, if you're going to push up our school fees, yeah. then we, we don't want to vote for you. But do you know what? Sorry, forgive me, just, just a final point. What, 
what th this illustrates to me is the confidence he has that he's going to win the next general mm. election because he can now he can now start paying off a few maybe conservative voters or a few floated voters because he doesn't need you now. He's going to it's going to be such a landslide he can start throwing out some unpopular middle to middle class people unpopular uh, policies. <laughs> It may not be quite the landslide that he thinks, don't forget. There are an awful lot of different features playing in and we've still got a few months to go, so he would be very silly if he was overconfident about it. But I, I don't know what the percentage is and it's probably not possible to find out, but there'll be a large percentage of, of families who do exactly as you said, Daniel, yeah. really give up. My parents gave up an enormous amount to send me to a private school and I rewarded them by being expelled oh, when I was 12. Oh, Christine, you? I know. <laughs> then I went to a state school and that did me a lot of good as well. Well, so I was very lucky. I had a very mixed education. But I know how much they... Uh, and my brother went all the way through and did extremely well in life. Um, and they gave up a great deal. And there are a lot of parents who do that. They, as you said, the education of their children is the but, most important thing. But the way that this question was framed, it's mm. like, I want another 20% off you. So that 20% is going to go and help other people's kids out. Why is there being taxed to the hilt? If you're earning 100 grand, that's net 67k. Mm. 33k goes to the government. And now they want to wallop another 20% on your mm. five, six, seven grand a term. I think he's School deluded. Fees. I don't think he understands. I don't get what he thinks he's doing with this one. But it doesn't make sense to take from more money from hard-working parents yeah. to subsidise a failing education system. All that's going to happen, Keir, is that these people are going to leave the private sector and then you're going to have to finance them in the state system. Overwhelming. And it's going system. to end up being something that will be quite... Uh, it'll be quite... It will be quite sort of emotionally challenging for the children who are moved from their school... Must be horrible. ..to a, a state school. Must but be horrible. It's, it's an ideological thing, isn't it? I mean, it's socialism, as you say. Of course it is. He wants to do. I want... Who's the Shadow Education Secretary? Do we know? I haven't got a clue. No, no idea. Well, I'll find out for you. We'll find Never out. Mind. Then, but, but, I mean, you know, well, who, who knows what will happen? Who knows? I wonder if the Labour Party are going to uh, win that election with a landslide. What do you think? Oh, and Danny, a quick one for you, actually. My oh. mum. My mum said, Danny, Danny, <laughs> he looks... Tell him for me. He looks like he's lost weight, Danny. Well, thank you, Mrs Aquia. Where's the camera? Gina. You, what's her name? Georgina. Georgina, thank you so much. And it's very observant of you. You've got good eyesight. I've lost a stone and a half. Thank you, Georgina. You've got a beautiful daughter, by the way. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> God, he's a creep. He doesn't <laughs> normally say that. <laughs> yes, there you go. There you go, Mum. There's Danny. Danny and Christine. Christine, say hi to her as well. Christine. Hi, Gina. <laughs> oh, sorry, wrong camera. Hi, Gina. <laughs> it's like the kitchen's hi, Gina. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Right, right, if you just tuned in, welcome. It's just coming up to 17 minutes after 4 o'clock. This is GB News. Coming up, World View will cross live to Los Angeles and get an update with what's going on in Israel as we find out what's happening around the world. But next, it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, is earning £100,000 a year enough? I've got a poll up right now on X asking you that very question. Is earning £100,000 thousand pounds a year enough send me your thoughts email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews cast your vote now free speech nation sunday nights from 7 p.m our first question comes from elliot elliot hello is, is Canada now an authoritarian state? Elliot, I think it's been an authoritarian state for a while. I mean, uh, under Trudeau, this is a new thing now, and this is coming from the Justice Minister, uh, who has Arif Virani, and he has defended this new power for their online harms bill. That sounds familiar. We've got something quite similar. And they're saying they can now impose house arrest on someone who they think might commit a hate crime in the future, right? That's scary stuff, isn't it? There's obviously a very dark side to this, because you can't, or you sh in my opinion, you shouldn't be able to imprison somebody before they've done anything. Right. Well, it is Canada. Well. And, <laughs> and uh, I know you, you in this country, you kind of kind of respect Canada as a country. America didn't even know it was a country until recently. <laughs> and I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to, to show themselves to be different than America. I think America has a responsibility to, to invade. Uh, you know what? <laughs> I do. You know, you're, you're kidding, but it may come down to this. It's, or this may just be a, pr a pr Right. Yeah, maybe. Well, I just think it's ridiculous that the idea yeah. of arresting someone... I mean, our government's yeah. bad enough, and the Scottish government's out of control, the Irish government's right. out of control. They're all talking about... I mean, the Irish government's got a new hate crimes bill where they're talking about they can seize your phone if they suspect you might have some material that could potentially yeah. stir up hatred. I mean, for God's sake, what does that mean? Your phone's full of that kind yeah, of thing. Well. <laughs>
The government knows that. Yeah. But um, but the, you're, you're right. But it has to do with the bigger picture, which is Canada has sucked itself in on the big team world. So, sorry, I'm going to say it. It's big team world. And what they're, what they're doing, this is not even a free speech issue. This is just about silencing uh, dissent well, against the Canadian government. It has nothing to do with openness and talk, whatever. It's like saying, we don't want these people to spread their you opinions. Know, opinions. Dangerous opinions. That's what speech codes and hate speech laws always do. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon. If you just tuned in, where have you been? Just coming up to 21 minutes after 4 o'clock, I'm Nana Akwe. This is GB News. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. Now, before the break, we were discussing Labour's education plans. Let's see what you've been saying. Brenda says, I worked at different times as support staff at two state senior schools. The discipline was lacking and I wasn't impressed with the teaching standards. Not all people who send their children to private schools are rich. In fact, quite a lot of state school teachers send their children to private schools. Exactly. Keir Starmer hasn't got a clue, has he? Ian says if Labour adds that to private school fees and as a result many kids have returned to public school, where will the spaces and the cash be to pay for them come from? Higher council tax and probably you know they're planning that one. John says how many Labour MPs send their kids to private schools? Yes. No one seems to remember that Diana, but I think we all remember that one. She had to defend herself for sending her kids to private school. Yes, exactly, whilst trying to sort of criticise them at the same time. Keep your thoughts coming. GBviews at GBnews.com. But now... It's time for the Great British to debate this out. And I'm asking, is earning £100,000 enough? Jeremy Hunt has raised a few eyebrows by saying that earning 100 k a year is not, a, not huge in his uh, Surrey constituency. Answering questions from his constituency about eligibility for government's childcare offers, the Chancellor said that £100,000 is not a lot of money in his area if you have a mortgage to pay. While some people have sought to defend Mr Hunt by saying his comments need to be considered in their context, both Labour and the Liberal Democrats were quick to describe his comments as out of touch, especially as the country is still in the midst of a cost-of-living crisis, most people only earning an average of £35,000. So, for the Great British debate this out, I'm asking, is £100,000 a year enough. Well, joining me to discuss this, GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson, businessman and activist Adam Brooks, political commentator and former Labour aide Stella Chad... I hate it when they do this. <laughs> Chad... What does it just write it normally? How is it, Stella? How do I say it? Chandekidu. Chandekidu. I could have said that. I didn't need all this stuff. And political commentator Emma Webb. Brilliant. Right, so I'm going to start with you, Emma Webb. Well, I, it's difficult because it's almost impossible to defend um, him against the accusations that he's out of touch because, of course, you know, maybe most people in this country are surviving on much less than that. Um, I think what you can say is that he obviously knows his constituents' own issues more than most people do. And if you do have a very large mortgage, with the mortgage rates going up, you can see how people who are, who are, who are whose... Um, means have had a result on their living standard yeah. and they therefore end up sort of strapped to a mortgage that they maybe can't pay, maybe they're struggling. But these things are all relative. And the, I think the real issue with what he said is that um, that uh, the government's assistance in helping with childcare is paid for at the taxpayer's expense. And that yeah. is paid for by people who are at the lower end of the income bracket. And so when you look at it, uh, his comments on a broader scale, when you're looking at the whole country and you're looking at um, the, the average salary, 
Um, of course, it seems extremely out of touch, but these things are always relative. So I think we can accept that some people who do earn a large salary relative to their own outgoings might find themselves in trouble. But I don't think it's right to say that, therefore, they should be entitled to um, other taxpayers paying for their childcare because it's one thing if you end up in trouble and you have to downsize and live in a smaller mm. house it's another thing if you're at the bottom end of the economic spectrum and if you end up in trouble you end up homeless yeah but it's ironic isn't it because wasn't it he that put up the interest rates for um so mortgages have gone up. I mean, it's his own fault, isn't it? If he's talking about his constituents, he's not, not being able to afford it. Perhaps he should consider the interest rates. Uh, <clears throat> let's go to... I, I can't say your name again. I'll say your first name. Stella. Stella. My first name is... <coughs> like no, I can do that. Like, St like Stella. Stella. <laughs> so, so 100K, right? Let, let's look at the number. Mm. So he's talking about... He, he talked a bit about the marginal tax rate, which I do agree needs to be reformed. Personally, I don't think that it is fair the, the way it is, it, is, it, is, it is made right now. But if you are earning 100 100k or more, mm. you are already at the top 3% in terms of income in this country, right? We know that last year, everyone's income fall except for the top 20%. Mm. So if you're earning above 100k, you're one of the very select, lucky few people in this country who saw their income rise in the last year. Now, in the same week that Jeremy Hunt made this comment, we had the report saying that 25% of children in this country live in absolute poverty. So that's a 30 years low. It's the first time since records began where we're, where, where we're seeing poverty rising again and, the, and, and living standards falling. Now, it's very nice that Jeremy Hunt has sympathy for people in his constituency and also that he announced that he's going to commit to the triple lock. That's very nice to see. It's also very nice to see that the government has a lot of sympathy for, for WASPy women and they are, at the very least, considering the fact that older people should not become poorer. Now, I would say... Very nice to have sympathy for older people and for people who are on the high income bracket. Can we please look at the children? Can we please make sure that young people are not becoming poorer as well? Can we please, please scrap the two-child limit? Can we please raise benefits for children who are going hungry? Okay. What about the 100 grand, though? Is that too much or not? The, the what, sorry? 100,000 pounds. Is that enough or is it too much? I think that is enough to survive, but it says something about our country that 100k is not enough to thrive. Wow. Uh, Adam Brooks. I find myself agreeing with those on the left. I think his comments uh, showed how detached from reality is. I'm, I'm really not a fan of Jeremy Hunt for many reasons. But a lot of policies, you know, during COVID and since COVID, um, especially tax, we, yes. we, it's the highest tax burden, I think, since World War II. Many, many decades. Um, Prices of, of, of electric and gas have gone through the roof. You know, I know I, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I, I've done well in life. I'm not a multimillionaire, but I, I earn OK money. But I've had to make a lot of changes. I've got three children. Now, to feed and, and entertain three children, now everything's gone up. Uh, my electric and gas has also gone up. My home bills, my car insurance, my house insurance. Everything has gone up and we are being taxed into oblivion in this country. Mm. Now, <clears throat> at the end of the day, someone that earns, say, 100,000, I put it in the tax calculator earlier, they clear about five and a half thousand pound a month. Now, suddenly you put in your mortgage, you put in this, you put in that. How much is actually left from someone mm. that has three kids? You know, and it's a hard thing to say because you have got people that earn a lot less, 30-something, 20-something. How are these people surviving? And I have a lot of empathy for these people because I know I'm having to change the way I live because of the tax burden, because of inflation. So my kids are never going to go hungry, but I might have to downsize in the future. I might have to make some big decisions, but my kids are not going to go hungry. Mm. There are families out there that must be pulling their hair out, you know, and, it, and it's wrong. We were meant to be a great country. And I think this government really has a lot to answer for, for those that are struggling. But listen, but listen, a lot of them will be pulling their hair out even more, having listened to that, because if we bear in mind that it's only the top tiny, what is it, 3% of people who are earning above £100,000. So for him to say that, mm. I think it's a bit, it's a bit ridiculous, really, uh, Nigel Nelson. And also because he's the one in charge of raising those interest rates, isn't he? He's the one that's in charge of talking about taxes. So if he's that worried about it, perhaps he could have come up with some better policies. Jeremy, this was a very...
very silly thing that you said, Nigel Nelson. Yes, it was a very silly thing. Um, as you said, Nana, the average wage is uh, 35,000 for a full-time worker in this country. Mm. As Stella said, 100,000 uh, is in the top 3%. So, of course, it's a huge kind of, uh, kind of salary. Even in Jeremy Hunt's own Surrey constituency, mm. uh, the median wage there is 42,000. So, um, those earning 100,000 in, Sur in Surrey are doing really well. The issue that, J that Jeremy Hunt has got to get to grips with, apart from the, the bizarre budget that he, he lumbered us with, um, is sorting out some of the anomalies. So, for instance, uh, on child benefit, you get taxed if you earn over 50,000. However, two people earning 49,000 don't get taxed. Mm -hmm. um, that is obviously um, uh, uh, an anomaly that needs to be... be I do take the point about if you're on 100,000, you don't get any help with childcare. If you've got two kids, you'll, you'll be paying 30,000 out. I just think it's... I don't really understand why he thinks that he should be saying out loud that 100 grand isn't very much money. Especially a when year. he's a multi-millionaire, Nana, yeah. you know? This, do, do, do you think, Stella, that this is sort of smacks of some sort of detachment? Because, honestly, we'll find somebody who thinks that he, what he's saying is true. There'll be people who believe him, who agree with him. It is, it is detachment and it is a, a, an empathy gap that he seems to be having. Because he is the chancellor, right? And he used to be health secretary and he used to negotiate with junior doctors. And, obviously, junior doctors make a lot less than 100K. And he used to say... Now, whether you agree with him or not, right? Whatever. Whether you agree with how much junior doctors are, 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 are getting, that's another conversation. Conversation. But he used to say, no, 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 you're making more than enough money to them. And, and now he's saying that actually, you know what, that 100K is not that much. <laughs> so where is the logic? One... Why is there such a big empathy gap? And at the same time, OK, if you don't think that 100K is enough for people in your constituency, what are you... So, so what are you telling to people who are basically uh, earning uh, 30K or let, let, me, K? let me give the last 30 seconds to Emma Webb, because, uh, Emma, Emma, so what do you think? What's your thoughts on £100,000 a year? Is it enough? Well, I mean, it's an interesting message, isn't it, for the Chancellor to send to suggest that £100,000 isn't enough when so many people are surviving on um, much less than the national average. Um, so, really, that he's actually strangely sending the message that the Conservative government haven't done a very good job because if you can't survive on um, okay. at the absolute maximum end, if uh, just short of um, being a millionaire, um, then there's something very, very, very wrong with the way that the economy has been handled. Yeah. Um, well, look, I do, I do think we we sh should recognise that there will be people who, particularly people who have very large mortgages who will be having a very stressful time trying to figure out how to make things work. Because people who have a larger income tend to have larger financial But, but that's because he it has raised... absolutely tone deaf from him. But that's his fault. He's raised the interest rates. It's his fault if that's yes. the case. So, if, you know, like, he's literally blamed himself. So, very briefly, Nigel Nelson, £100,000 a year. Is it enough, yes or no? <laughs> uh, it's too much. Uh, uh, Adam Brooks? Well, relatively, yes, it is. But one, one message to the Chancellor, stop taxing success in this country. Stella. It's stifling growth. Stella? No, it's not enough. And Emma Webb, is it enough? Um, I mean, you can survive on it, so it's enough. Yeah, that's enough. All right, thank you so much to all of you. Thank you so much. What do you think, then? Uh, is £100,000 enough? Maybe you earn £100,000. Maybe you're watching now thinking, £100? £100,000? If only I could earn that. Well, uh, get in touch. GBviews at gbnews.com. This is GB News. Coming up, we'll continue with the great British debate this hour. I'm asking, is earning £100,000 a year enough? You'll hear the thoughts of my panel, Danny Kelly and Christine Hamilton. And still to come, my outside guest. She recounts her experience being trafficked. You've got to listen to that in Yugoslavia. But first, let's get your latest news headlines. Nana, thank you very much. Good afternoon. From the newsroom, a recap of the top stories just after half past four. Russia's Black Sea Fleet is now functionally inactive. That's according to the Defence Secretary in the UK after a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol. This was the moment two Russian Navy vessels were targeted and then struck. Well, security sources have told GB News that UK-supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used in that strike. 
and we understand a major military communication centre has also been damaged. It marks the largest attack on the Russian-controlled port in the war so far as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Four suspects have been taken to Russia's investigative committee headquarters following Friday's terror attack. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the shooting, which killed more than 130 people. The US has backed that claim, but Russia is continuing to suggest that Ukraine was involved. Allegations Kyiv has denied. Back here in the UK, hundreds of pro-Palestine and environmental protesters are currently demonstrating outside the British Museum in central London. Activists can be seen waving banners and Palestinian flags, shouting, hands off the Middle East. The group, calling itself the Energy Embargo for Palestine, say they will keep targeting the historic building until it ends its partnership with BP. It comes after the British Museum confirmed it was extending its partnership with the oil giant in a deal worth £50 million. And Joni Mitchell has returned to Spotify more than two years after boycotting the music streaming service over comments by the controversial podcaster Joe Rogan. The legendary folk singer announced that she was pulling her catalogue from the site in 2022, joining fellow musician Neil Young. It was in protest against Spotify's multi-year deal with Rogan, who's accused of spreading misinformation about Covid vaccines. Both artists have called on the streamer to address the spread of false information. Those are the headlines. More in the next half hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code on your screen or go to our website, gbnews.com slash alerts. For now, though, it's back to Nana. Thank you, Sam. It's just coming up to 36 minutes after 4 o'clock. This is GB News on TV online and on digital radio. Coming up, World View will be crossing live to Los Angeles and then to Israel to get the latest on what's happening around the world. But next, it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, is £100,000 a year enough? I've got a poll up right now on X asking you that very question. Send me your thoughts as ever. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week. And if you I haven't, haven't well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he? Just leaning against the just fence. Just chilling, just yeah. relaxing. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were two. Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle. But they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained for, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver. And Danielle joins us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through. We've followed them and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine. He's, he's, he's on his phone um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, He's on the phone to the, the the sort of the emergency crew in panic, thinking he's going to sink. Um, so we could not just sit there and watch. Um, he's absolutely terrified. Yeah, poor bloke. Well done, you. Do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad? It is because although I do sympathise with them, they are so red taped. But surely, sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel.
Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. This is the GB News. We are the People's Channel. Don't forget, download the GB News app. It's very good. You can stream the show live also on YouTube. But it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, is earning £100,000 a year enough? Jeremy Hunt has caused controversy by saying that earning that much is not huge in his Surrey constituency. Camilla Tomley pressed him on this earlier today on GB News. Grand isn't a large amount of money to earn? Well, um, I was talking to a lady who was explaining to me the average house prices in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. And, um, but you know. But when... that's under 14 <clears throat> years of Tory rule, isn't it? I mean, 100 grand is what? Four times more or less the average salary in this country. So that's a hell of a lot of money to earn, isn't it? Why, why are people on 100 grand feeling that they don't have enough money under a Conservative government? The reason is because um, we've been through a very difficult period. We've had a pandemic, we've had an energy crisis. And by the way, it's not just people on that salary, it's mm. people on all salaries. Mm, yeah, but also 100 grand, though, isn't it, because of you putting up the interest rates? Listen, while some have sought to defend Mr Hunt, both Labour and the Liberal Democrats were quick to describe his comments as out of touch. So for the Great British debate this hour, I'm asking, is earning £100,000 enough? Right, so let's see what my panel make of that. Joining me, broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly, and also author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton. Danny Kelly. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use his qualification. So his qualification was 100 grand is not a huge, that was his word, it's not a mm. huge amount of money because the average property price is £667,000. So let's just using that qualification. So would £50,000 be considered a huge amount of money if the average property price where you lived was £330,000? And I don't think 50 grand is a huge amount of money mm. and we're using his precise qualification. So the house prices are 650,700 grand average a lot a lot will be a lot more and a few will be a bit less obviously the average so I don't think it is a huge amount of money if you live in that particular part of Surrey mm. if you're in inner city but, Liverpool it's a massive amount of money it's life-changing yeah but, but okay so and it is the Bank of England that raises interest rates to be fair Bank to of England, do you? but he does come up with the tax structure and the systems and stuff so he's got to take responsibility that's right the Bank of England reacted to government policy that's yeah right. well exactly but they're reacting they're all, they're all in it together really they're all talking and discussing it's not coming out in isolation uh, but but Let's be honest, he, him and his government have come up with some ridiculous policies. They've taxed us to the hilt, and in normal times, 100 grand would be perfectly enough. But the way he's done it, if 100 grand isn't enough, then neither is 35,000. Christine? It's, and we all do stupid things, and we all do stupid things on social media, but for him to put out... He is the richest, apparently, member of the Cabinet, maybe not richer than Rishi Sunak, but he's right up there. He's an incredibly mm. rich man. And to sort of come out with a remark like that, saying 100,000 isn't very much... I mean, talk about cocking a snook at... at the average working person. Mm. I mean, the average um, wage in this... I think it's 30,000 or something, or is it less, I think. Um, of course, it depends where you live, and 100,000 will get you far more up in the inner city, Liverpool, than it will in the green pastures of Godalming, I think it is, where his constituency is. But, um, yeah. I mean, yes, it's a lot of money. The top... I think it's the, 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 the top 4% in this country, so it's a very small number of people mm. earn over 100,000. We're talking about a minuscule number. And then the top 1% earn way, way more than that. So most people don't earn, earn, earn 100,000. I mean, MPs any minute now are going to be earning 100,000. Their salary has just yeah. gone up. And if 100,000 is a lot of money, why do so many MPs moonlight and earn money elsewhere? Well, that's if because they're greedy 000... and they're using their position to acquire mm. more mm. income. But, but if, if you're Jeff... an MP, you need to just focus on... On that job, I don't think they should have second jobs at all. I actually think that that's a big enough job. You've got a constituency of thousands of people 
to look after. So how, how is it that you need to do another job? I, 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 I think we're it? being unfair on <clears throat> Jeremy Hunt. If there was £100,000 on this table in £50 notes, I would say that's a huge <coughs> amount of money. But this is not what he's saying. He said he, it's not a lot of money. I would say it is a huge amount of money if there was hundred grand on our table. But that's not what he's saying. And he's qualified. He's been specific. And I think that we're being unfair to him. He is saying if you live in Surrey and your average yeah. house mm. price is 670 grand, £100,000. And let's not forget, £33,000 of that £100,000 goes, goes to the town. government. You are left net £67,500. No, I don't. You, you That's not a it. huge amount of money. No, no, but, but it depends what you think huge is. But the, the bottom line here... <laughs> I just think it's a very <laughs> crass, <laughs> crass and stupid, silly thing for a politician in his position to have said. I mean, you know, you can I argue disagree. till the cows come home whether it's a lot or a little, because it all depends on a myriad of factors. I just think for him to drop that into the pot is just. I stupid. think it's unfair. You're forgetting his precise qualification. But he said not. he said in that part of the world, it's not a huge amount of no. money. Yeah, no, I know he said that. I'm just thinking, I just think the whole... F why did he bother to put mm. that out? We, uh, look, look at the discussions we're having. It's all over the newspapers about how out of touch he is. Um, but that's, that's why... I think that's what people are being unfair about the whole situation is. He's out of touch. Why is he out of touch? He's, well, he's talking specifically about living in a 700 grand house in Surrey. But he's the Chancellor. He's presided over the state of the economy. He's presided over the fact that we've got the highest level of tax. I know other people have control over mm. different levers, but he mm -hmm. is the Chancellor. Exactly. He's the one who... Has has overall, he is the figurehead for the economy of this country, and it's pretty dark. But you're right. What does huge mean? The definition <laughs> of huge. Well, exactly. It's so subjective. No, but but, but in general, I think a hundred thousand pounds is a lot of money to earn. To be oh, fair, if it was and on that table, I'd no, agree with you. it's a lot of money. And also the fact that he's focusing on his constituencies, as as he, that is his constituency, he is meant to. But he, of course, as those houses are expensive, and if you can't afford to live there, then you move somewhere else. Because if you've got such a large salary and you can't afford to live in the house that you're in, then I'm sure he'll be the first to tell you that you should cut your coat according to your... Well, he... So you're agreeing with him? As Chancellor, he... In a roundabout no, way. No, I'm not agreeing with him. You are. He's saying him. if you haven't got 100 I'm grand, it's... you're not going to live there. I'm saying that what you should be telling constituents who can't afford to live in this constituency to move somewhere else where they can afford. <laughs> right. That's more I've or just less got what to he's saying. I've okay. got to get these people right. on, because the show is nothing without them. <laughs> Our great British voices. Let's welcome uh, one of you on. Who have I got? John Reid. In Kill Kidderminster. Let's go to Kidderminster. No map. The map's gone, John. The map. Where John. John. We all know where Kidderminster is. I didn't we know. I've got a clue. Map, don't, we? don't we? We love the map, Nina. Yeah, I know. Um, is earning £100,000 a year enough? Enough for what? It depends on your life expectations, doesn't it? I bought a house in Walton on Thames in Surrey in 1970 for £4,650. Wow. Lived in it for 10 years. And a very low salary. It's all relative, isn't it? Uh, but I think what he's saying is completely wrong. And I'm, I'm with um, Christine on this. He's yeah. being rather stupid, talking the way he does. He's yeah. coming from a position of somebody with loads of money. Uh, the highest salary I ever earned and when I was in proper work, uh, which I've been out of for some years now, but for, for proper work, £40,000. But I live now live in Kidderminster, which is a much cheaper place to live. So Exactly. Well, what, what well, John... Well, John, that's the point I'm making, that if the people are coming to him say they can't afford to live there, they should find somewhere they can afford. John Reid, thank you so much. He's that great British voice. This is GB News coming up in the next hour. Of course, we're going to be discussing. I'm asking you whether defence spending or tax cuts, which one would you prefer? But next, World View will get the latest from what's happening in the US and Israel. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We've seen a much quieter day across the UK today, more than aware of sunshine than on Saturday, but things will turn more unsettled again during the week ahead. It's this little ridge of high pressure that's been moving in from the west, quieting the weather down, but notice low pressure gathering again out towards the west, and so this will be turning things more unsettled through uh, tonight into Monday. As we go through the evening and overnight period then, the showers towards the north and east of the UK will tend to ease. We'll see lots of clear weather around, and here it will turn quite chilly with a touch of frost by Monday morning. Whereas out towards the west and southwest, that rain is gathering. Some of the rain starting to turn quite heavy by the morning on Monday, accompanied by quite blustery winds too. But notice an increase in temperature out towards the west as that rain arrives. Into Monday then, uh, plenty of bright weather towards the north and east of the UK, one or two showers up towards the far northeast. still a bit wintry in nature here, but elsewhere it's all about the wet and windy weather moving in from the west and southwest. So many western and southwestern parts of the UK, particularly down towards the southwest, seeing some very heavy rain at times on Monday. 
And as that rain moves into colder air in Scotland, we could see some snow falling, particularly during the afternoon into the overnight period. And again, some of that snow above about two or 300 metres could be quite heavy in nature, with heavy rain towards the south and east of Scotland. That sets the scene for a very unsettled air across Scotland on uh, Tuesday. Again, heavy snow across the hills, heavy rain towards lower levels. Elsewhere, a mix of sunshine and showers. And that sets the scene for the rest of the week ahead. All the areas seeing unsettled weather, showers are longer spells of rain, with temperatures near average. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon. This is TV News on TV online and on digital radio. It's time now for World View. Donald Trump has been in the news for all the wrong reasons again. The president being told that he's come up with has to come up with half a billion to cash uh, for because he's obviously losing his assets potentially because of all this nonsense that's happening around him. Joe Biden's already come up with his a nickname for Donald Trump ahead of the upcoming rematch. Broke Don is what he's calling him. But let's talk to the host of the Politics People podcast, Paul Dudridge, to get the latest. Paul Dudridge. We've not got much time, so what have you got for me? <laughs> um, yeah, you've covered it beautifully. Sorry, I'm in, a, I'm in the Mojave Desert filming. Um, the um, Donald Trump in court tomorrow has to come up with half a billion dollars by tomorrow or potentially lose his properties. It looks like what the uh, prosecutors will do actually is go straight to the bank any New York bank, they'll walk in with a court order and demand a certified check, a cashier's check, I think they call it here, uh, of all his bank assets. Uh, Donald Trump, President Trump, is saying that he actually now does. His lawyers last week, when we talked before, said he didn't. So he's saying, I do have the half billion dollars. I don't want to spend it on this. I want to spend it on the campaign. One of the strategies he might adopt tomorrow, and this is what... Uh, we're all waiting to see, is he might just declare bankruptcy. If he declares bankruptcy, this kicks it again into the long grass, and there has to be a lot of procedures and a lot of legal wrangling. The problem is, apparently insiders are saying he doesn't want to declare bankruptcy, Some a strategy he's used uh, uh, many times in the past. He doesn't want to declare bankruptcy because it will invite a lot of ridicule, bearing in mind he's presenting himself as a businessman uh, running for president. So that's apparently low down on his list of, uh, of options, but it would actually get him out of a very tight suite. Or he might just hand over the money tomorrow. He might he actually. Might. And it's outrageous that he has to. Listen, Paul Dudley, we've got to go. But it's good to talk to you. And maybe one week when you come to the UK, you'll come and do your, your bit in the studio. Paul Dudley. Thank Love you so it. much, host of the Politics People podcast. Right now, let's quickly fly over to Tel Aviv and have a chat with Mr. Fire and performer Uri Geller for the latest on the ground in Israel. Hi, Uri. So what's been happening? Hey, Nana. Listen, um, I've got to tell you, yes, it's finally happened. Uri Geller is in a straitjacket. Look. Oh, yeah. See? And look up there, Houdini. And I'll tell you why. But before my critics get too excited... Let me explain you why I'm in a straitjacket. Believe it or not, this straitjacket belonged to none other than Houdini. 
the most famous escape artist in the world. I got it as a gift to put on display in my museum. But Nana, look at me. What you see is exactly how Israel is fighting the war in Gaza in a straight jacket. Israel is having its arms held behind its back by the rest of the world. I'm being serious now, Nana. Mm. This is how Israelis feel. We're being told, stop attacking, stop defending yourself, don't go into Rafa, open the borders, don't do anything at all, give Gaza everything. Nana, look, it's like having handcuffs on, and these handcuffs belong also to Houdini. Now, listen, Nana, how would Britain feel if the rest of the world told you in 1982, call a ceasefire with Argentina over the fall plan, don't finish the war, or let's go back to 1945, stop fighting Germany because you're killing civilians? Well, this is what it is like for Israel now. The world mm. is letting us down. This week, Canada said it will stop sending arms to Israel. The Netherlands, Japan, Spain, and Belgium have already suspended arms sales. And before yesterday, Nana, let me just finish, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, came to Israel and preached to our prime minister. Mm. But we said, thanks, but no thanks. Look, Nana, Listen, Israel but... is fighting a moral war. And oh, we're Gala. doing everything. Can you... Oh, can, can we, you we are running out of time, Uri. So sorry, we don't have more, but I get your point. Thank you so much for joining me. That's the brilliant Uri Gerla. But first, let's get an update with your weather with Marco. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw a quiet today weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are turning more unsettled once again. During the week ahead, we wind and rain at times. A ridge of high pressure brought a quieter day on Sunday, but low pressure is already gathering towards the west and that will move in during the week ahead to return to unsettled conditions. Wind and rain already arriving across the west and southwest of the UK through the overnight period. Some of the rain turning quite heavy in places, whereas towards the north and east it's clearer, just one or two showers lingering, and certainly a touch of frost possible in the north and east by the early hours of Monday morning, whereas out towards the west and southwest those temperatures will start to climb. As for Monday itself, with a very wet days in store across some western and southwestern areas, particularly across the southwest of England, some very heavy rain developing here at times. Whereas towards the north and east, it's a bright picture at least for time before wind and rain starts to move in from the southwest, turning to snow as it reaches colder air across parts of Scotland, especially on the hills north of the central belt and particularly later on in the day. Temperatures peaking at 12 Celsius down towards the southeast, a bit colder though towards the north and northeast. As for Tuesday, well, a very unsettled day is expected across Scotland. Rain and snow at times, snow chiefly on the hills, but some of that rain and some of that snow could be quite heavy. Elsewhere, it's a pretty unsettled day. Rain or showers never too far away. And those temperatures struggling, reaching average figures at best, and staying pretty unsettled in the week ahead, with showers or longer spells of rain. And again, those temperatures struggling into the low double figures. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. There's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,300 £145 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out.
With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, if you just joined me, welcome aboard. It's just five o'clock and Nana Aquia. This is GB News on TV, online and on digital radio. Uh, for the next hour, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big topics hitting the headlines right now. We'll be debating, discussing, and at times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today is broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly, also broadcaster and author Christine Hamilton. Coming up for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking what would you prefer, defence spending or tax cuts? And imagine this being people traffic. Now, my outside guest will be here to share her harrowing story and her inspirational campaign against the practice. She's here live. She'll be talking about that in a couple of moments' time. You really won't want to miss her story. It's quite incredible. And why was producer Alex fined 150 quid? Was it A, spitting gum, B, for skipping a queue, or C, for picking his nose? Stay tuned to find out. But first, let's get your latest news. Nana, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the GB Newsroom. I'm Sam Francis, and a look at the headlines just after five o'clock. Russia's Black Sea Fleet is now functionally inactive, that's according to the Defence Secretary, after a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol. For those watching on television, this was the moment that two Russian Navy vessels were targeted and then struck. <laughs> Security sources have told GB News that the UK supplied storm shadow missiles in that strike. A major military communication centre was also damaged. It marks the largest attack on the Russian controlled port in the war so far, as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Meanwhile, Islamic State has released new footage which appears to back up the terror group's claim that it was behind Friday's attack in Moscow. We have chosen not to show that video, but this footage for those watching on television shows the four suspects being taken into custody for interrogation in the Russian capital. Russia is claiming without evidence that they were detained, attempting to escape across the border into Ukraine. Ukraine, though, has denied any involvement. And Simon Harris has been confirmed this afternoon as the new leader of the Fine Gael party, paving the way for him to become Ireland's youngest premier. It follows the surprise resignation of Leo Varadkar on Wednesday this week for what he described as personal and political reasons. Well, at the age of just 37, Mr Harris is expected to be formally elected as Taoiseach in April after the Easter recess. And speaking moments ago, he said he would repay the trust put in him with hard work. Hope, enterprise, 
equality of opportunity, integrity and security. I have been in this party since I was 15 years old, and those values mean and meant everything to me, because I believe in public service. I believe in the power of politics to make a difference. I believe that politics as a profession can make people's lives better. Meanwhile, in London, hundreds of protest, uh, protesters and environmental campaigners are still demonstrating outside the British Museum this afternoon. Activists can be seen waving banners, Palestinian flags and shouting, hands off the Middle East. The group calling itself the Energy Embargo for Palestine have said that they will keep targeting the building until it ends its partnership with BP. Well, that comes after the British Museum confirmed it was extending its partnership with the oil giant for another decade in a deal worth £50 million. In other news, the Chancellor has defended the government's record on affordable housing after claiming £100,000 a year is, he said, not a huge salary. Jeremy Hunt says it doesn't go as far as you would think for people in his Surrey constituency amid higher house prices there and the rising cost of living. The average home now costs around eight times the average income in the UK and it was half that in the 1990s. The Chancellor told Camilla Tomney on GB News this morning that lower taxes will make a difference. The average house price is in that part of the world £670,000. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're paying childcare, um, what looks like a very high salary doesn't go as far as you might think it would. If you look at the average salary in this country, £35,000, um, they have been feeling the pinch. And those people will see their tax bills go down by £900 this mm. year. If you look at people on an even lower salary, uh, the lowest legally payable salary, the national living wage, because I've increased that to £11.44, they will see if they're working full time, their income go up by £1,800. Joni Mitchell has returned to Spotify more than two years after boycotting the music streaming service over comments by the controversial podcaster Joe Rogan. The legendary folk singer announced that she was pulling her catalogue from the site in 2020, joining fellow musician Neil Young. It was in protest against Spotify's multi-year deal with Rogan, who's accused of spreading misinformation about COVID vaccines. Both artists have called on the streamer to address the spread of false information on the site. And finally, fast food was given a very new meaning in Paris today as cafe staff took part in the traditional waiter's race. The famous course de cafe returned this afternoon. Well, the famous race returned this afternoon after a 13-year break. Around 200 waiters raced across the city through the streets, carefully balancing a tray with a pastry, cup of coffee and a glass of tap water balanced in their hands. The race was first held in 1914 and even today waiters are still expected to dress in their Sunday best, Paris being the city of style. The winners of the race this year took home a complimentary meal and tickets to the Olympic Games in Paris. <laughs> Fascinating stories here on GB News. For more of the latest and breaking stories, you can scan the code there on your screen. GBnews.com slash alerts is the other way to get the latest updates. But now it's back to Nana. Good afternoon. It's just coming up to seven minutes after five o'clock. This is GB News. For the next hour, me and my panel will be taking on some of the big stories hitting the headlines right now. As ever, this show is all about opinion. It's mine, it's theirs, and of course, it's yours. We're debating, discussing, and at some times we will disagree, but no one will be cancelled. So joining me today is broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly and author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton. Still to come each Sunday at five, I'm joined by someone who's had an extremely interesting career to take a look at life after the job. We talk highs, lows and lessons learned and what comes next on the outside. And today, I'm joined by a victim of human trafficking who had their organs harvested. Really? Gosh, this is such a good story. You can't go anywhere for this one. You've got to stay. Then for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, what would you prefer, defence spending or tax cuts? A poll for The Telegraph has found that the majority of Conservative voters would prefer an increase in defence spending over tax cuts. But what, what about you? What do you think, defence or tax? 
Then, as ever, get in touch. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. She's had her organs off. She's still here. I don't know which ones they must have been. Right, each Sunday at five, I'm joined by someone who's had an extremely interesting experience. And we talk about life afterwards. We talk highs, lows, and lessons learned and what comes next on the outside. My guest is a remarkable individual who's transformed adversity into empowerment, a survivor of human tra trafficking. Uh, she's now an acclaimed author, motivational speaker, and a presentation skills coach. Her international career spans continents, empowering C level executives, diplomats, and charities alike through her work. She fosters connections, overcomes obstacles and promotes positivity for transformative outcomes. That sounds incredible, but who is she? I'm delighted to say I'm joined now by author and human trafficking survivor Loretta Lyon. Right, so Loretta, first of all, which organs did you have harvested? Did you? You didn't have organs. No, not myself, but okay. these were the human trafficking, sex trafficking, and so what they did with the girls were, once the girls were done with their sexual exploitation, mm. they never set them free, so they just took the organs at the end, no. and then said, yeah, and they killed them. So, I mean, it, it's very big news. It doesn't take a rocket science. You, know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work it out who these people are. If you just Google sex trafficking and organ harvesting during the war in former Yugoslavia, a lot of in the information will be shown on on Google and all about it. Really? I haven't gone... I haven't Does mentioned them on my book because I don't want to start a war with, with people that you can't finish a war. It's, for me, it's not about starting a war. I just want to raise awareness so we can stop this. So talk to me about your story. How did you find yourself in a position where you were being trafficked? What, what, what was going on? Where, where were you trafficked from? How did you find yourself in that situation? Well, it was war in former Yugoslavia, and we happened to live in Serbia. And um, our town was singled out for ethnic cleansing, and we were about to be massacred. The story is really deep, and this scene, I'm not doing it justice, but after so much struggle and my uncle bribing the army to set the town free, which they did, surprisingly, after he gave all his wealth, and so thanks to him, the whole town is still alive, uh, my dad said, you've got to run away because now the soldiers are raping and abusing women and children. He said, I want you to go to Kosovo, cross borders illegally and find shelter at the charities like Red Cross and so on. Long story short, I crossed the borders. I ended up in the streets of Kosovo only to be discovered by two UN police officers, which were Americans. And to this day, they're still my friends, Peter and Brian. And they realized I couldn't speak any word in English anyway, so everybody needs to know this. So I had a translator there, they had a translator. And they said, you can't be going to the shelter because you are from Serbia, this is only for the Kosovans, but we'll give you shelter until we know what to do. Lo and behold, I was with them for quite some time and the translator at the time went and reported to the local guys that there is this really young girl from Serbia that's being sheltered by the UN troops. How old were you? I was 17, 18 at that point. So still super young, turning 18. In fact, it was, I think, around that time it was my birthday because I remember them being a bit special about it. And... Um, and I was never allowed to leave their apartment without them, but this one day after I did all the cleaning, which they didn't ask for, I just did it out of gesture of goodwill because they looked after me so well. I thought, you know, I've done all the chores and there is no electricity, so should I maybe just go and get a magazine? And the thing is that I speak Albanian fluently and Serbian fluently. So I went to get an Albanian magazine or, or newspaper just to read. And that's when I got taken by human trafficking. They were really? guarding, they were literally spying on our apartment. And just as I walked out with the door, I left the door open outside, uh, you know, of the apartment because I thought I'm coming back. And they just took me and off I went. So, so you were outside the apartment and yeah. they literally just rustled you up and put you in a van? Literally, I, d I was about... <clears throat> I always say this in my speeches. I was about to tell them off to say, whoa, you don't go on mm. the pavement kind of thing. Mm. And then I didn't have time to speak. I had this thing thrown over my head and then I was shoved into this van. I felt like I was dreaming, but it was happening at the same time. And I just wanted to wake up from this nightmare that I found myself in. But uh, during the process, when they, so they took me to this boss guy, mm. and during the process <clears throat> of, uh, the boss said, um, 
please, could you, um, please, could you, I'm being too polite now. He just gave the order for me to, to be raped. And that's when I screamed uh, because I was thrown on the floor and being abused. And I said, please don't, don't do this, I'm a virgin. I was terrified and I was crying, obviously. And he heard that and said, guys, stop, we have stumbled across a huge cargo. And I'm thinking, what cargo? Young, naive cargo? I thought it meant goods. But to them, cargo was humans, young humans, men, women at all sorts of ages. I didn't know this until they groomed me and then they were communicating with me because I was with them the whole time. I was the only one with mm -hmm. them at that time. I was precious to them. Before they um, were about to ship me on to the highest bidder that had bought me, they groomed me and the grooming process was really horrific of having, you know, to, to watch some really quite crazy sexual acts and abusing other women just for the sake of me to learn something. Uh, I think for me that will haunt me for the rest of my life, even though I've healed quite a lot. I've never made peace with the people that haven't made it through. They haven't made it out alive like I did. And I was really, really lucky to have escaped them. I'm not gonna spoil the book, obviously, mm. for the readers that like to take that time to read about these stories, but uh, so, I so managed were you, to... Were you on your own with these guys, these people, or were there others? Because you said that there are other people that didn't make it out. The girls that they were bringing in, mm -hmm. that they were raping, and for, for my sake, to learn how sexual acts are done or what's so, so expected. So this wasn't even a video, you actually had to watch I people. had to watch live. Uh, Oh, wow. Live rape. Oh, that's awful. Apologies to anybody who, that, that you may find this distressing. So. Yeah, sorry. I know it's um, it's hard to digest sometimes, and I think we just need to be comfortable with the uncomfortable in order to make a difference in the world, because this is going on in this country as well. We've got British national girls that are in our safe houses, and they've been trafficked by their boyfriends mm. or rather someone else, but. Uh, it's still going on under our very nose, under our, a country that is actually so established and is safe. It's not even war here. So this is happening with, with or without war. So how did you get out of that, though? Because you said you, you escaped. You're lucky to have escaped. What, what happened? Uh, Without giving too much away, I don't want to spoil yeah, the book. Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to. I don't want to because it's a whole long story about what happened between the whole grooming system and before I escaped. But that particular night, because I caused so much. Every opportunity I got, I caused a scene. In restaurants they were going, they took me with them. And so I would want to go to the bathroom and then I would cause a scene and then the guards would hold me and throw me. So I think the, um, the staff that were working in these pizza places and restaurants, they realized this girl is under tremendous amount of stress and maybe they reported it that something is happening. By the time we reached the house where they were holding me and training me this particular night, the boss got a call and he said she is m more trouble than she's worth it. Please rape her, kill her, discard her body. I don't want her. She's crazy. He got so mad and he literally ran out of that apartment and he left this young, the youngest team member to do all of that on his own. And that's when my frenzy started of me thinking, oh my God, I am about to die. And so I, my intention to escape was never there, but I just wanted to buy myself a bit of time. It's really scary knowing you're gonna die. So I just said to him, please let me pray um, because I'm, I'm really scared. And can we do this, you know, with kindness? And um, he gave me that, I have to say, and I managed to pray and as I was praying, he went to the bathroom and he left um, the keys on, on the table, the glass table and the gun. And um, when I turned around to see what the click was about, because I was praying on the floor, like to mighty God, like I've never prayed before, I, I noticed the keys and I thought, I can't touch the gun. I've never held a gun in my life. So I took the keys, went to the doors. I was fiddling with the doors. It was two doors. One was wooden from the inside and the metal from the outside, like a prison door. Mm. So when I was fiddling with that door, I opened it eventually, but it made so much noise that alarmed him. And so I started running from the fourth floor, like skipping all those stairs. Mm. And he was right behind me. And then when he reached me at the end of those stairs, he punched me so hard, I went flying onto the main road. Oh and God. by this point, it was after midnight. That's when I saw 
a flashing light of a police officer parking his van, his truck, sim same as my police officers, Peter and Brian, was white, red. So it was very clear to me it was a police officer. I just started screaming. And this Italian police officer heard me, UN police officer. He then was coming towards me to see what's the distress on the middle of the road. And the guy started shooting at him. And the police officer was defending, so he was shooting. They were shooting at each other where I was crawling on the floor wow. towards the police officer. So after that, they took me to the police station. I gave my interview. They asked me to appear in court and then potentially Hague. I said, I want nothing to do with this. Here's the interview. You've got everything you need. I said, I just want to go and die with my parents in Serbia during the war. Because I said, this is, it's just scared me for life. And they reunited me with Peter and Brian. I um, then said goodbyes. It was the last time I saw Brian and went off. But when I returned back to Serbia, it's, it's mentioned in the book, and I just give people some background. I crossed the border illegally, which we were not, not meant to do. And um, in, in the courtyard, in our house, just in the garden, a van pulled in as just as I walked in to say hi to my mum and dad. And they took me and they imprisoned me for six months in a solitary confinement. Wow. And that was really, I thought that was bad in Kosovo, but then it got really bad uh, with sexual abuse and um, and I got I got deformed. I, I mean, everything has been fixed with surgery. Really? Yeah. But I was, uh, I was really deformed. Wow. Yeah. So, and then six months was a, a molding time for me. It was, um, um, they taught me a lot of hate and I, I don't know, things that I didn't know because I was such a happy kid. And they also, that molded me to, to think that maybe, maybe, just only maybe, there is some good in them that they haven't discovered yet. And I started seeing them. I was feeling sorry for them, not for me anymore. And I would just disconnect from, when they were abusing me sexually, I would just sort of meditate what I know now as meditation and think of people that inspire me, like Nansal Mandela. He was always my inspiration in what he went through with his, you know, wow. injustice and, you know, just people that inspire me throughout my life and thinking you, of my you, mom and... You yeah. are so brave. To Sorry to break down. I never, no, I never thought I would so break brave. down. You are so brave and that is such an incredible story. It really is. Wow. It's just horrific, but it shows that, you know, I learned, I learned to love and I love, learned forgiveness and now I just want to raise awareness. Mental health has become such a big topic for me and I care for everyone. We've been divided over the years by religion, by colour, by ethnicity, by so many things, gender. I think if we just strip all that away, we realise we're just all the same. Mm. And if people could just, for once, not be divided and just look, just find that in themselves, we were born to be one and support each other. We should be each other's allies and not the enemy. And I said this at the uh, awards, didn't I? <laughs> well, she won an award, of course she did. Uh, Inspirational woman. I know, it was just... Um, wow. So, yeah, I want this story to reach people with inspiration, just as it has been, uh, to my surprise. I mean, everyone can relate to it because they're relating to the pain and the struggle. Uh, you know, everyone has to go through war and kidnapping, but... Yeah. yeah. Well, for those listening on radio, what's the book called and when is it out? So the book is called um, Unbroken, Surviving Human Trafficking by Loretta Lyon. And... Um, it's available on Amazon only to order and it gets delivered straight away the next day. Well, listen, Loretta, thank yeah. you so much for sharing your My story. As a, an amazing story. I hear you now, a jiu-jitsu star after <laughs> that. You learned some jiu-jitsu. <laughs> it's true. She is. Oh, thank you, Nana. But I had to keep my mind and, you know, zen, so I turned into martial art just to, to be able to, you know, tame my demons. Well, Loretta, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you that. for having me thank today. You for thank you, Nana. I appreciate that. That's Loretta Lyon. She's a human trafficking survivor. And if you're a victim of trafficking or suspect someone may be a victim of trafficking, you can contact the Modern Slavery Helpline confidentially on 08000 121 700. And it's open 24 hours a day. That's 08000 121 700. It's open 365 days a year. If you want to remain anonymous, that's fine as well. Just, you can also contact Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111.
Well, that was my outside guest, an incredible story. Wow. Listen, stay tuned. Coming up, I'll be joined by my great British voices, their opportunity to tell us what they think about the topics we're discussing, because up next in the Great British Debate, I'm asking, would you prefer defence spending or tax cuts? I've got a poll up right now on X asking you that very question. Send me your thoughts. Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet me at gbnews. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. This is Louis Walsh, and if you're watching this year's series of Celebrity Big Brother, you will, you will know uh, what Louis Walsh has been talking about. It is the fact that he's been di diagnosed or he's had a battle with a rare blood cancer and nobody knew anything about it, Joanna. Yeah, I mean, um, we all kind of remember Louis, don't we, from um, X Factor, and he's a very much loved character. Mm. Louis always used to be the one that would kind of take all the kooky acts and all the quirky <laughs> ones. Obviously, it's incredibly brave for him to actually share something so private um, about this diagnosis that he had. Um, but also, you know, when things like this happen with people who are public figures, it also brings a lot of awareness, and a lot of people have been watching Big Brother. We're obviously talking about it now, when this is the type of blood cancer that I'd never heard about. I mean, it is incredible, isn't it, really, what it would do to raise awareness for people? For sure. And I think it's really important because I think quite often people watch these programmes and it can be a little bit silly and mm -hmm. arguments and stuff. But actually, when someone that's got a lot of media attention, like Louis Walsh, mm -hmm. talks about this, a lot of people start mm -hmm. to think, you know, cancer research do a lot of good work. I'm not shocked that he's doing that. He's, he's a very Marmite figure, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of us have seen what Jedward have been saying about Lou Walsh behind the scenes, you mm. know. He's a very kind of, a lot of people say he's quite a nasty figure. Oh. You know, he's been in the show business a long time. He knows how to get certain people to do certain things. And I think he's, um, he's great for the programme, though, because, you know, that's what we want, right? We want reality TV to be exactly how it is, you know. Mm. That's actually one I'm thing sure. that I've I thought in terms of casting for Celebrity Big Brother. They did a really good job yeah, in getting Sharon and Louis, Louis in there. We're getting all the Hollywood gossip, yeah. you know, who they like, who they don't like. And I think Simon that's been the great. Day. That was good, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is he a colourful character? Colourful, yes. That's how you But just... when you said he's like Marmite, you've got to think, you can put a bit of Marmite in your bolognese and it tastes good. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon. This is GB News. Welcome. If you just tuned in, you've just missed an incredible story. My outside guest, Loretta uh, Lyon. Uh, but this is GB News. We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. You can catch up, actually, via the GB News app or on YouTube if you uh, want to hear that story. But it's time now for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, would you prefer defence spending or tax cuts? A new Savant poll for The Telegraph found that most people who voted for the Conservative Party in 2019 want the government to spend more money on defence instead, cut instead of cutting taxes. And all of this comes at a time when some important members of the party are pushing for tax cuts to win back voters. But the survey shows that many Conservative voters are more concerned about funding for our armed forces, especially with the growing threat from countries like Russia. Only 27% said that the government should cut taxes. The findings come after a number of senior Tories called for the party to raise its defence spending to 3% of GDP. So for the Great British Debate this hour, I'm asking, what would you prefer, defence spending or tax cuts? Well, joining me to discuss, the director of Popular Conservatives, Mark Littlewood, uh, former British Army commander, Colonel Richard Kemp, and independent economist, Julian Jessup. Right, well, so what do you think? I'm going to start with you, Colonel Richard Kemp. Yeah. <coughs> what do you think? Uh, Defence spending think, or tax um, cuts? 
Well, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm certainly not a, um, an economist or an expert on our financial system, but um, I don't think it's a binary choice between defence spending and tax cuts. There's no doubt in my mind, and you probably expect me to say this, that we definitely need to spend more money on defence. Mm. Our, our defences have been whittled away very, very badly over many decades, and we now face probably the greatest threats that this country's faced since the Second World War without adequate defences to confront them. So that, that I think, is, would be my starting position. But whether or not that can only be funded by tax cuts, I would, I would strongly question. And perhaps, perhaps you could look at you know, other, other areas of our economy that could be reduced in order to pay for extra defences, like, for example, some of the immense social welfare bills that we pay, which I'm sure there must be plenty of room for trimming them. Uh, things like overseas aid, of course, some of it is important, some mm. is valuable, some is needed, but not all of it. And, of course, there's vast amounts spent, some would argue, squandered on the climate change issue, which perhaps is a, a threat that people disagree on for the, for the distant future. But the defence, the problem we face in defence is an immediate threat which does need to be addressed. So maybe money could be got into defence from one of those areas for example. Hmm. All right, um, let's try uh, Mark Littlewood. He's the director of Public Conservatives. Mark. Well, Nana, you might find that we're all going to vociferously agree in terms of this big debate. But it's, it, it, as we've just heard, it's, it's not a straight binary choice. Uh, when forced to make one, I did say tax cuts, because I think the taxation is now so horrifically mm. high in the British economy. Uh, that we've got to reduce taxes to try and incentivise work, uh, and we're not really doing that. But when we actually are looking at things we want to spend more on, and I'm concerned that defence spending is not sufficiently high for our needs, and you would have thought the defence of the realm is basically the first priority of government mm. expenditure, the number one priority. Well, I, I agree with what's just been said. Let's try and find some cuts elsewhere. We've got to get off this argument that... If we identify an area of spending where we want more spending, it has to be taxes going up rather than just recalibrating our spending priorities and deciding that mm. we're, I don't know, not going to spend quite as much on welfare or not quite as much on some of the other things listed. So uh, tax cuts, please, uh, a high priority for me. But of all the things we do spend money on, defence is probably the one closest to my heart. Mm, mm. Yes, but in, I, I hear you, but in an ideal world, obviously that would be lovely if they would be uh, prepared to sort of rebalance the spending, but that doesn't seem to happen, does it? They just put the taxes up. So, um, Julian Jessup. Well, I'm, I'm going to agree with uh, Richard and, and Mark. I don't think it is a, a straight choice between increased spending on defence or, or cuts in taxes. Indeed, there, there's some way that if you target the tax cuts well, you can actually boost growth in the economy and end up with more tax revenues in order to finance increased mm. public spending on defence. Um, I think there, if there is an exception, it probably is defence. Um, defence is what economists call a, you know, a public good. It's something that really the state has to provide rather than the, rather than the private sector. Mm. And we are facing you know, extraordinary challenges. You know, the, 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 what's happening with Russia, but also the growth of China. Uh, and you know, your very striking interview that you just had with... Um, with Loretta Lyon emphasising there's some very bad people even in the, the rest mm -hmm. of, of mainland Europe. So um, I would make defence a priority, but I think there are savings that can be made elsewhere in the budget. By the way, including in the defence budget, I mean, defence procurement is notoriously inefficient. We have a habit of spending billions of pounds on, on, on rubbish projects, often because we want to sort of build our own, you know, British light tank or whatever else it might be rather than buying an off-the-shelf version that we know works from some other country. So there are pretty big savings that make even within the defence budget. But I think the case that increasing defence spending does look increasingly strong over the last few years. Mm, OK. Well, thank you for your thoughts, Julian Jessup, independent economist, Conor Rich Kemp, former British Army commander, and Mark Littlewood, director of the Popular Conservatives. Thank you so much. Well, what do you think? You're with me. I'm Nana Raquel. This is GP News on TV, online and on digital radio. Coming up, we'll continue with the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, defence spending or tax cuts? What would you prefer? You'll hear the thoughts of my panel, author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton, also broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly. But first, let's get your latest news.
Nana, thanks very much and uh, good evening to you. It's just gone 5.30. Uh, first, I just want to bring you some breaking news coming to us out of Kent this evening. That uh, a boy aged just 12 years old has been charged with attempted murder. That's after a teenage girl was stabbed in Sittingbourne shortly before 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. We understand the victim was taken to hospital in London to receive treatment, though she is now in a stable condition. The boy, who cannot be named for legal reasons, will, we understand, appear in court on Monday. In other news, Russia's Black Sea Fleet is now functionally inactive. That's according to the Defence Secretary after a massive Ukrainian missile strike on Sevastopol. This was the moment two Russian Navy vessels were targeted and struck. Well, security sources have told GB News that UK-supplied Storm Shadow missiles were used in that strike. And we understand a major military communication centre was also damaged. It marks the largest attack on the Russian-controlled port in the war so far, as tensions in the region continue to escalate. Meanwhile, four suspects have been taken into uh, Russia's investigative committee headquarters following Friday's terror attack. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for the shooting, which killed more than 130 people. The US, meanwhile, has backed that claim, but Russia is continuing to suggest that Ukraine was involved. Allegations, though, Kiev has denied. And the British Museum was forced to close today as hundreds of pro-Palestine and environmental protesters gathered outside. Activists were seen waving banners and Palestinian flags, shouting, hands off the Middle East. The group, calling itself the Energy Embargo for Palestine, say they will keep targeting the museum until it ends its partnership with BP. It comes after a partnership with the oil giant was extended for another decade in a deal worth some £50 million. Those are the headlines. More in the next half hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For now, though, it's back to Nana. Thank you, Sam. Coming up, Supplement Sunday, where my panel and I discuss some of the stories that caught our eyes. But next, it's time for the Great British Debate. And I'm asking, would you prefer defence spending or tax cuts? GB News Breakfast, every day from 6am. New rules are going to give staff at NHS England paid leave if they suffer a miscarriage. Yeah, any of the NHS England staff who miscarry in the first 24 weeks of pregnancy will be able to take 10 days paid leave. Their partners can take five. Well, we're lucky enough right now to be able to speak exclusively to the founder of George's Law and national baby loss campaigner, Keely Lengthorn. A very good morning to you, Keely. First of all, um, it's called George's Law because it is a, a major step forward and that's one of your son's names, isn't it? Yes, it is, Anne, yes. Um, I lost my son, unfortunately, George, um, two years ago. Um, he was still born at, at 23 weeks. Um, I was flabbergasted after having George to know that I was required by law to return straight back to work the next day. So under current legislation in the UK, if you give birth to a baby under 24 weeks, the law says you should be going back to work the next day. So, for instance, I left George at the mortuary on a Thursday evening, had a midwife coming to stop my milk on a Friday, but the law says I should be in work the next day. Such an archaic way of, of working now, and I don't know why we are not following the New Zealand model. And changing law and allowing employees three days paid leave. So under legislation in New Zealand, all employees get three days paid leave in the event of a miscarriage under 24 weeks. And it, it is it is so um, brilliant to see the NHS sort of taking a stance. They're the UK's biggest employer, 1.7 million employees. And they're, let's face it, they're on their knees in terms of financial hardship. But if, if, the, if the NHS can do this, I don't know why others can't. Yeah, and um, you make the interesting point as well that uh, although it is now there for NHS workers, they may have to face sending home bereaved parents who haven't got that right. 
Join us every night on GB News at 11 p.m. for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11 p.m. every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, I'm Nana Akwe. It's just coming up to 38 minutes after 5 o'clock. If you just tuned in, where have you been? We're live on TV, online and on digital radio. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And it's time for the Great British Debate this hour. And I'm asking, which would you prefer? Defence spending or tax cuts? A new Savannah poll for The Telegraph found that most people who voted for the Conservative Party in 2019 want the government to spend more money on defence instead of cutting taxes, which is, seems to be the options that are available. And, of course, the tax burden is hitting a record high. The Chancellor has been under pressure from his Conservative colleagues to cut taxes even further, and from his friends in his own constituency, frankly, because if they can't live at 100 grand, then there's obviously something wrong. But the survey shows that many Conservative voters are more concerned about funding for our armed forces, especially with the growing threat of countries like Russia. Only 27% said the government should cut taxes. So for the Great British debate this hour, I'm asking defence spending or tax cuts? Which would you prefer? Let's see what my panel make of that. I've got broadcaster and author Christine Hamilton, also broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly joining me. Um, Christine Hamilton. Well, any half-decent Tory government would be able to do both, tax cuts, cuts mm. and increased defence spending. But we haven't got a half-decent Tory government. We've got this lot. Um, yeah, no, defence. I'm very st strong on defence, and I think um, we're one of the few European countries who actually does pay our NATO commitment, and Donald Trump is absolutely right. Why should we go on defending you? you know, we can't just always sit under the American umbrella. We've got to pull up our socks, and our European neighbours have got to pull up their socks. We don't even have... The technical definition of an army, apparently, is 100,000 people. We haven't even got that. We've got 87 or something. And then we had the fiasco with the aircraft carriers the other day. Do you remember? One of them didn't have any planes, oh, and the yeah. other one broke down before it had left Portsmouth <laughs> Harbour. I mean, dear God... God, we need to get our act so together on defence. It's so embarrassing. They didn't is, have the crew, did they, either? It's the first duty of a government is to defend. And, OK, I remember when the Berlin Wall came down and the Cold War came to an end, etc., etc., we all thought, oh, this is wonderful, we're never going to have any wars again. And, look, we've got, you know... the. The world is more inflamed now than it has been for a very long time. So, yeah, we need to pull our socks up and spend money on defence. Mm. And we need to get our army fit as well. I mean, the, the standards of fitness have declined in the army. Some of them can't even run around a tennis court with getting out of breath. And they're spending um, a very large <laughs> amount of money on diversity and inclusion. Oh, that's officers. got to stop. So that's, that's, that's got to, got stop, to stop, exactly. Sorry, rant over. Why did you look at my tummy when you said they're not very fit? That was I fraud. Didn't. You... You're she did. It. She did. I did as well. I, yeah. <laughs> just, Danny, just to illustrate someone who's not have very fit. You got a persecution complex. I did no, not. No, he's just got a bit of a I'm, belly at the moment. I'm but taking the mickey out of you. Your stone. microphone. I'm taking the mickey he's out of you. He's lost over a stone and a half. Stone and a half, I yeah. Know he really has. good. Okay, I'm going to disagree. And, Jolly good. And, and I think that we, I think we need tax cuts. And I'm going to say something quite controversial. And I'm going to take it from one of your contributors, one of your panelists. And what he said was, and, and I think this, this hasn't really been mentioned until about ten minutes ago is that we are spending so much dough of the taxpayers' hard-earned pounds, pennies and shillings mm. on this sort of green agenda. Mm. We need to stop oh. spending the money on something that may or may never happen in the future, and we need to focus on the immediacy of a potential world war conflict. Mm. We need to divert the dough we're spending on green stuff, yep. and we need to plough it into the defence. Mm -hmm. So, if you like, I'm having the best of both worlds. We're having tax cuts, mm. and we, we can benefit from that in our, 
Why you make me laugh? Do you make me laugh? Beautiful face. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she just smiles want. at me. Uh, and, and what we do is we plough it. We take it from the green stuff. We plough it into the defence. And there's so much we're spending on the green stuff. We can actually there's, have the best a green of both one worlds here already. Yeah, and we have <laughs> tax cuts as well. We have tax cuts but, as but well. But they could also. He also mentioned the fact that defences waste money really badly by buying bad equipment and bad things that don't work. So they need to stop wasting money on. Well, they need to sort that out. Big, and that's a lot of money. That's well, they need to sort that out. We need to stop wasting money we have, fortunately, on, on things like HS2. And as for this nut zero, I call it, we've just discovered around us we're going to have the largest solar park in planning in the whole country. Oh, really, no. Really, right bang on our doorstep. Oh, no. And no, some Christine. friends of ours, I mean, this, you know, this is their house, and at the moment they're surrounded by fields. If this goes through, they will just look out 100% on solar panels because a few greedy landowners have put their land into this pot. Well, that's because... They will benefit, but the rest of us, mm -hmm. the taxpayer, and through energy subsidies, will be paying for that. That's right, get... in subsidies, yeah. In subsidies. So it doesn't so even make sense. It doesn't no, make sense. Stupid. Green energy would we, never happen if it was... We, had to we be need economic. to take the dough out of that, that group think. We need to take the money that's going towards that group think, Christine. We need to tax and we need to cut tax for the average... Joe mm. on the street, mm. and also the amount of billions we've given Ukraine. Our, our, our munitions must be so depleted. Well, they are, yes, obviously. Mm. Well, well, listen, this shows nothing without you and your views. Let's welcome our great British voices there. Opportunity to be on the show and tell us what they think about the topics we're discussing. I've got two of you this evening. Let's start with Julie in Bedfordshire. Julie, what do you think? Defence spending or tax cuts? Yeah, hi, Nana. Um, I don't think it's as clear cut as that. I agree with your um, your panel, which was saying it's it's a mixture of both. Um, if you cut from taxes and give it to defence, how are they going to manage that money? And that, again, comes back down to business management. Mm. We see the same problem with the NHS. They have enough money. They just don't know how to spend it properly. We heard from your panel, um, Colonel Richard Kemp, um, that they, they're not spending it on the right things. They're buying, buying the wrong equipment. And I think that's what they've really got to focus on. It's not about robbing Peter to pay Paul and trying to just move the money around. It's about spending it properly. Um, I think our defence needs to be the priority. We are probably on the verge of a, a third world war, sadly. Um, and I don't think our defences mm. are anything that would be able to defend this country as much as we need it. Mm, but, but if it was binary, so we have defence spending and tax cuts, you would prioritise defence spending, yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Defence would be prioritised for me. Uh, Alan in Grimsby. Uh, good afternoon, Alan, Colonel. Good I afternoon. would say um, I agree with your panel. Is there should be money to, to do both. If we spent our money wisely instead of frittering it away on insane projects like the Net Zero project, we'd have the money there for defence. If push came to shove, I'd definitely go down the, the side of the defence. Mm. Uh, spending. However, the trouble is that even they can't spend it properly. They waste a huge amount of money as well. So we have incompetent government and incompetent civil servants. Therefore, we just throw money literally into a black hole year after year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, you two. <laughs> Julie Ford in Bedfordshire and Alan McNeely in Grimsby. Thanks for cheering us up. <laughs> Those are my great British voices. <laughs> they have a point, though, don't they? This is the problem with all of it. The NHS, they spend, the government spend money so badly. If it were their own personal money, then they would spend it properly, I can guarantee it, don't you think? Especially Jeremy Hunt, if that was coming out of his pocket. Mm. Well, listen, coming up, Supplement Sunday, where my panel and I discuss some of the news stories that caught their eye. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We've seen a much quieter day across the UK today, more than way of sunshine than on Saturday, but things will turn more unsettled again during the week ahead. It's this little ridge of high pressure that's been moving in from the west, quietening the weather down, but notice low pressure gathering again out towards the west, and so this will be turning things more unsettled through uh, tonight into Monday. As we go through the evening and overnight period then, the showers towards the north and east of the UK will tend to ease. We'll see lots of clear weather around, and here it will turn quite chilly with a touch of frost by Monday morning. Whereas out towards the west and southwest, that rain is gathering. Some of the rain starting to turn quite heavy by the morning on Monday, accompanied by quite blustery winds too. But notice an increase in temperature out towards the west as that rain arrives. Into Monday then, 
Uh, plenty of bright weather towards the north and east of the UK. One or two showers up towards the far northeast. Still a bit wintry in nature here, but elsewhere it's all about the wet and windy weather moving in from the west and southwest. So many western and southwestern parts of the UK, particularly down towards the southwest, seeing some very heavy rain at times on Monday. And as that rain moves into colder air in Scotland, we could see some snow falling, particularly during the afternoon into the overnight period. And again, some of that snow above about two or 300 metres could be quite heavy in nature, with heavy rain towards the south and east of Scotland. That sets the scene for a very unsettled air across Scotland on uh, Tuesday. Again, heavy snow across the hills, heavy rain towards lower levels. Elsewhere, a mix of sunshine and showers. And that sets the scene for the rest of the week ahead. All the areas seeing unsettled weather, showers or longer spells of rain, with temperatures near average. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good evening. If you just tuned in, welcome on board. This is GB News. He's Nana Nicey, Nana Nicey. Uh, we're live on TV, online and on digital radio. There's just 10 minutes left of the show, but it's time now for Supplement Sunday, which is the part of the show where my panel and I discuss some of the news stories that caught their eye. Joining me to discuss, author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton, and also broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly. Right, who wants to go first? I will. OK, go on then. Well, I mean, this, this, is the, well, it, this is a true story, but to me it's ridiculous. Harrods are selling an ironing board, an ironing board, for £4,000. £4,000. Yes, £4,000. So I mean, admittedly, it's a work of art. It's part of a limited numbered edition. You receive a keychain made in Paris from upcycled Swarovski, or whatever you call them, <laughs> crystals. I mean, it is mind blowing. £4,000 on a laundry. But if you've got 100000 a year and you don't live in Godalming, Surrey, you've probably got 4000 to spare. God, that's unbelievable. Isn't it? Four grand for an ironing board. Four grand for I an don't ironing, do ironing board. Ironing to me is the spawn of Satan. I don't own an ironing board. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do that sort of thing. I just have things that you can just <laughs> don't need to Drip iron. dry. Exactly. Danny Kelly, would well, you buy a £4,000 ironing board? Well, He's I, got one. I don't iron much. And uh, luckily, this jacket will cover all the creases. Uh, ah. this is, no, I wouldn't buy a £4,000 no, ironing you board. Would, OK, you right. Uh, I, I Cat or dog people? I'm a cat man. I don't know I'm how you... Cat. Oh, 100% cat. Are you cat or dog? I don't think I like either of them. They don't like me. Okay. I'm, I'm maybe a dog. I'd have a dog if I was going to have anything. Well, well the, this is from the Liverpool Echo. Liverpool Echo! <laughs> Un <laughs> unwanted alley cats are shining stars at a new cat cafe. Uh, Jackson's Rescue Cat Cafe in Hoylake were found abandoned in terrible conditions. There's dozens of them. Basically, the idea is that they open up a cafe and there are cats crawling around and snuggling on your knees and you're having a bite to eat and everything. They're climbing walls. And these are all moggies that really were in terrible state, probably very ill. Full uh, of fleas. Well, they probably were full of fleas. They're not full of fleas now, but they would have been full of fleas. These are these are cats that either have been thrown away, abandoned, or they've just been a litter, and they've just you know they, they were just about to so die. They're being rescued. A cat on... cafe in it, Oil Lake. It sounds, oh. It's a bit, beautiful story. It is. It sounds a bit like the the cafe on Fleabag, where, where there were guinea pigs running around all over the place. Do you remember that? Oh no. If you didn't watch Fleabag. I didn't watch Fleabag. But I'm a cat man. I love cats. You, I, I don't. I don't I love cats. Oh, it's cats like running around. As long as they don't scratch leather, because I don't like that. They include my sofa. Now, listen, earlier on the show, I did ask you, as, as I was standing at my little new wall, 
I was asking you, uh, what do you think my producer, Alex, uh, got £150 fined for? Uh, it was either A, spitting, I think it was, B, uh, jumping the queue, or was it C, <laughs> um, a bit of mucus from his nose like a bogey? Uh, well, <laughs> you'll be, you will honestly, you will not believe it, but uh, he was fined £150 by Ealing Council for picking his nose and apparently dropping some mucus on the floor by some jobs worth enforcers. I know. That's not, it's scarcely it's Absolutely it's not no, absurd. You know, he was just, he was tapped on the shoulder by two community support officers uh, and he was told that picking his nose and dropping mucus on the ground uh, counted as littering. <laughs> now, he obviously at first I... thought this was a joke uh, and they were bored or just being made to patrol the streets on the Sunday sure. morning. But then it became quite clear to him that they were serious. And if you go to the Jubilee's website, you can actually see the fine, the fixed penalty notice that he received. I mean, I, I can only assume. Is Alex telling us everything here? It's, <laughs> no, I'm being serious because what you see a lot of people do is they block one nostril off and then exhale oh, violently. No, stop it. no, I'm being serious. Didn't. You exhale violently through the other, my... the open nostril. He said he didn't do that. He didn't do that. No. So he just picked his nose, bogey, did rolled pick... it, bogey, flick I on the floor. So... Did you, did did you, did you pick your nose? I'm and going. I've had enough. Did you on your fingers and then went like that? And did he flick it at the most? Of you? I'd ask to see the video evidence. I think he did what footballers do. And girl, like... No, he didn't. He he's... said he didn't do that. Oh. He says he's not paying the fine anyway. Is he not? That's what it says here. He's not going to have to pay it. McLeod, who does not intend paying the £150 fine, considered not handing over details needed for officers. However, after the pair reportedly became irate and increasingly insistent, he did hand over his name, date of birth and address to prevent the police being called. So I think this is watch this space and see I what think, happens. I think, yeah, we've got to find out what happens. Apparently, dropping mucus is an offence under the Environment Protection Act 1990. Well, if Section they... Section 87. If they could just find the mucus for you to identify oh. and prove that you actually dropped yeah, it. Yeah, DNA it. That's, that's absurd. It's I think ridiculous. there's more to this story that Alex no, is telling not. us. No, Alex has said that it's he didn't It's just mind-blowing, isn't it? No, it's um, so absurd. It's littering. I'm reading the ticket. Littering. That's what littering. they're calling it, though, just for... Dropping so, a bogey. Just, You're there's guilty there's a... of an offence if he, well, maybe she, too, throws down, drops or otherwise deposits any litter in any place to which this section so applies and leaves it. You if know when you were at school when somebody did pick their nose and they did that and they rolled it and then it went like that? I think that's... Sort of what That's what he did. did. I'm just in my ears. Is that what you did, Alex? So what he did. I think he did. That what... is what he did. That's what he did. He, he picked his nose, rolled it, and did, flicked it. You know, it. you do the roll, and then you go like that. Stop it, I've Alex. I've seen Christine do that loads you outside have the studio. Not. Listen, according to listen, well, listen on today's show, I've been <laughs> asking what would you prefer, defence spending, be quiet for tax cuts. <laughs> according to our Twitter poll, 58.6% of you said defence spending, <laughs> and 41.4% of you said tax cuts. And on the other question of whether earning £100,000 a year is enough or not, 80. 0.9% of you say yes, of course it is, and 19.1% of you say no. Well, listen, a huge thank you to my panel author and broadcaster Christine Hamilton and also broadcaster and journalist Danny Kelly for joining oh, me today. Oh, Danny! <laughs> and thank you to you for your company and thank you to Alex as well, my producer. It's his last day today. He got his £150 fine. Uh, so, listen, you'll never forget us. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, take care. I'll see you all next. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, here's your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. We saw a quieter day weather-wise across the UK on Sunday, but things are turning more unsettled once again. During the week ahead, we wind and rain.